Chain Fire by Terry Goodkind. Continuing on page 424. Kara let go of his wrist with one hand to press her fingers to her forehead as she tried to gather her senses, tried to calm her sudden rapid breathing. Lord Rall, you can't do this. You can't. You're not thinking clearly. You're swept up in the passion of the moment, the passion of wanting something you think she has. You've got it in your head that you have to have it no matter what. You don't even know what she's offering. As angry as she is at you, it's most likely that she has nothing of any real value. I have to know something that will help me find the truth. And there is no assurance that this will. Lord Ra, listen to me. You're not thinking clearly. I'm telling you, the price is too high. There is no price too high for Kalin's life, especially if the price is merely an object. This isn't her life you would be buying. It's just a witch woman's word that she can tell you something useful. A witch woman who wants to hurt you for rejecting her. You said yourself that nothing she's ever told you before ever turned out to be the way she said. This will be no different. You will lose your sword and it will be for nothing of value. Kara, I have to do this. Lord Raal, this is crazy. And what if it's me that's crazy? What are you talking about? What if all of you are right and there really isn't any Kalin? What if I'm crazy? Even you think I am. I need to know what Shota can tell me. If I'm wrong about everything I believe, then what good is a sword going to do a crazy man? If all of you are right, that I'm delusional, then what good can I do anyone else? What good am I to anyone if I'm crazy? What good am I at all? Her eyes looked liquid. You're not crazy. No? Then you believe there really is a woman named Kaylin and I'm married to her? When she didn't answer, he pulled her other hand off his wrist. I didn't think so. Kara turned angrily to Shota, pointing with her Aegeel. You can't take his sword. It isn't fair and you know it. You're taking advantage of his condition. You can't take his sword. The price, I asked, is but a trifling. The sword isn't even his. It never was. Shota beckoned with a finger. Samuel, watching from the shadows, scurried toward them through the trees. Kara stepped between Richard and Shota. It was given to Lord Raal by the first wizard. Lord Raal was named to the post of Seeker and given the Sword of Truth. It's his. And where do you suppose the first wizard got the sword in the first place? Shota pointed a finger tipped with a long red lacquered nail downward at the ground. He got it here. He came here into my home and stole it. That's where Zed got the sword. Richard doesn't carry it by right, but by theft. Giving it back to its rightful owner is a small penance to pay for what he wants to know. Kara had a dangerous look in her eyes as she lifted her Aegeel. Richard gently grasped her wrist and lowered her arm before she started something that he knew could quickly turn ugly. He wasn't sure of the results of such a confrontation, but he dared not risk losing what Shota could tell him, or risk losing Kara. I'm doing as I must, he told Kara in a calm voice. Don't make this any more difficult than it already is. Richard had seen Kara in every sort of mood imaginable. He'd seen her happy, sad, disheartened, resolved, determined, and enraged. But until that moment, he had never seen her anger focused so intently, deliberately, so directly at him. And then he had a sudden vision of her taken by cruel anger once before, a long time ago. He couldn't afford to suffer the distraction of any such memory right then, and shoved it out of his mind. This was about Kalen and about the future, not about the past. Richard pulled the baldric off over his head and gathered it together with the scabbard. Samuel, not far behind his mistress's skirts, stood quietly watching, his greedy eyes riveted on the wire-wound hilt. Holding the gleaming gold and silver scabbard in both hands, Bundled together with the ancient tooled leather baldric, Richard lifted it out to Shota. 
She made a move to take it. The sword belongs to Samuel, my loyal companion. She smiled triumphantly. Give it to him. Richard stood frozen. He couldn't let Samuel have the sword of truth. He just couldn't. He wondered then just what he thought Shota would want with the sword if not to give it to Samuel. He guessed that he had been trying not to think of what it really meant to hand it over to Shota. But the sword made him like that. Zed told me that the sword's magic did that to him, turned him into what he is now. And when he has back what belongs to him, he will be who he once was, before it was stolen from him by your grandfather. Richard knew Samuel's character. As far as Richard was concerned, Samuel was capable of anything, including murder. Richard could hardly give something so dangerous as the sword of truth to someone like that. Too many people like Samuel had carried the sword, had fought over it, stolen it from one another, sold it to the highest bidder, who then became a seeker whose services were for sale to any loathsome cause that could pay the price. In the shadows it passed from hand to hand, used for vile and violent purposes. By the time Zed had finally gotten the Sword of Truth back and eventually given it to Richard, the Seeker had become an object of scorn and contempt, seen as nothing more than a criminal and a dangerous one at that. If he gave the sword to Samuel, it would be that way again. It would start all over again. But if he didn't, then Richard had no chance of ever stopping the far greater threat very likely loose in the world, or of ever seeing Kalin again. While Kalin was of paramount importance to him personally, he was convinced that her disappearance augured an ominous menace far more sinister, with potential harm on a scale he feared to contemplate. His responsibility as the seeker of truth was to the truth, not to the sword of truth. Samuel inched closer, his eyes on the sword, his arms reaching, his palms held up, waiting. Mine, gimme, Samuel growled impatiently, his hateful eyes glaring. Richard lifted his head to look at Shota. She folded her arms as if to say that this was his last chance. This was the last chance Richard had of ever finding the truth. If he had known of any other way to find a solution, no matter how remote that chance might be, he would have taken the sword back and taken that chance instead. But he couldn't lose this chance, lose what information Shota had. There was nothing else to do. With trembling hands, Richard lifted the sword out. Samuel, unwilling to wait the final seconds until it reached him, lunged and snatched the sword away, finally clutching the coveted object to his breast. The instant he had it, a strange look came over his face. He glanced up into Richard's eyes, his own wide with wonder, his mouth hanging agape. Richard couldn't imagine what Samuel was seeing as a result of having his hands on the sword of truth. Richard thought that perhaps he was simply awestruck to realize that he actually did have it again. He suddenly skittered away, swiftly disappearing into the trees. The sword of truth was once again among the shadows. Richard felt naked and stunned. He stared off in the direction Samuel had gone. He wished now that he had killed Shota's companion the first time Samuel had attacked him. Samuel had attacked Richard more than once. Richard had let those chances slip away. He turned a harsh glare on Shota. If he harms anyone, it will be on your head. I am not the one who gave him the sword. You did so of your own free will. I did not twist your arm or use my powers to force you. Do not try to shed responsibility for your own choices and actions. And I am not responsible for his actions. If he harms anyone, I will see to it that this time he pays for his crimes. Shota glanced off among the trees dotting the sweep of grass. There is no one here for him to harm. He has his sword. He is happy now. Richard seriously doubted that. With quiet fury, he turned his attention to the matter at hand. He didn't want to hear any of her excuses, so he came right to the point. You have your payment. 
She stared at him a long time, her face unreadable. Finally, in a quiet voice, she spoke a single word. Chain fire. She turned and started toward the road. Richard seized her arm and turned her back. What? You wanted what I know that can help you find the truth. I have given it to you. Chain fire. Richard was incredulous. Chain fire? What does that mean? Shota shrugged. I have no idea. I only know that it is what you need to know to find the truth of all this. What do you mean you have no idea? You can't just tell me some word I never heard of and then leave. That's not a fair trade for what I've given you. Nonetheless, that is the agreement you made, and I have upheld my end of the bargain. You have to tell me what it means. I don't know what it means. But I do know that it is worth the price you paid. Richard couldn't believe that he had agreed to a deal in which he got nothing of value in return. He was no closer to finding Kalin than he had been before he'd come to see Shota. He felt like sitting down right there on the ground and giving up. Our business is concluded. Goodbye, Richard. Please leave. It will be dark soon. I can assure you, you would not like to be here when it gets dark. Shota started down the road toward her palace in the distance. As he watched her go, Richard reprimanded himself for embracing failure without even trying for success. He now knew something linked to the mystery. It was a piece of the puzzle, a piece of the solution so valuable that it had previously been known only to a witch woman. It confirmed for him that Kalin was real. He told himself that he was a step closer. He had to believe that. Shota, Richard called. She paused and turned back, waiting to hear what he might say, looking like she expected a tirade. Thank you, he said in a sincere voice. I don't know what good knowing the word chain fire will do me, but thank you. You have at least given me a reason to go on. When I came here, I had none. Now I do. Thank you. She stared at him. He could not imagine what she could be thinking. Finally, she took a slow step back toward him. She clasped her hands before herself, looking down a moment before she stared off at the trees, apparently considering something. At last, she spoke. What you seek is long buried. Long buried? He cautiously asked. Like the word chain fire, I can't tell you what that means. Things come to me in regard to issues, problems, questions. I am the carrier of the information, the channel, you might say. I am not the source. I can't tell you the meaning, but I can tell you that what you seek is long buried. Chain fire and seek something long buried, Richard repeated as he nodded. Got it. I'll not forget. Her brow twitched as if something else had just come to her. You must find the place of the bones in the deep nothing. Richard felt goosebumps racing up his legs. He had no idea what the deep nothing was, but he didn't like the sound of it or the sound of looking for bones. He refused to consider the dire implications. Shota turned again to the road and started making her way toward her palace. She had not gone more than a dozen paces when she stopped and turned back her ageless eyes met his gaze. Beware the viper with four heads. Richard cocked his head expectantly. I don't know what that means, the viper with four heads. Whether or not you realize it right now, I have given you a fair trade. I have given you the answers you needed. You are the seeker, or at least you were. You will have to seek the meaning to be found in those answers. With that, she turned for the final time and walked off through the golden light down the long road. Let's go, he said to Kara. I'd not like to find out why we don't want to be here when it gets dark. Kara cast him an icy glare. I would imagine it has something to do with a murderous maniac wielding a deadly sword coming at you out of the darkness. Richard gloomily supposed that she might be right. 
Samuel would probably not be content to simply have the sword. He would probably want to eliminate the rightful owner and thereby any chance that Richard might lay claim to it or somehow get it back. Despite what Shota had said, the real thief had been Samuel. The sword of truth was the responsibility of the first wizard. He was the one who named seekers and gave them the sword. It did not belong to whoever might possess it by any means. It belonged to the true wizard named Seeker, and that was Richard. With sickening dread, he realized that he had betrayed the trust his grandfather had placed in him when he had given Richard the sword. But what value would the sword be to him if keeping it meant that Kaelin would lose her life? There was no higher value to him than life. Chapter 43 Richard was so deep in thought that he wasn't fully aware of the arduous climb up the steep face of the cliff and out of Agaden Reach. In the golden light of the valley below them, the long shadows of trees lengthened across the green fields, yet the quiet beauty of the place as the sun sank behind the enfolding mountains was lost on him. He wanted to be far away from the valley and out of the swamp before darkness took hold for good. He tried to devote his efforts to that task, that mission, of putting one foot before the other, of moving, advancing, by the time they reached the top of the cliff and the vast swamp guarding the approach to Shota's home, it was an early dusk in the deep niche of the towering mountains that ringed the place. Because the walls of rock cut the sunlight off early, it left the sky overhead a deep blue, but that light was unable to effectively penetrate the forest canopy, so that in the late day the vast green bog seemed mired in a perpetual gloom of half-night. The deep shadows were very different than those in Shota's valley. The shadows in the swamp concealed palpable, but for the most part ordinary threats. The shadows around Shota concealed dangers that were not so easily appreciated, but that Richard suspected were far more pernicious. The sounds of the dank swamp all around him, the chirps, the whistles, the hooting calls, the clicks, the distant cries, hardly registered in Richard's consciousness. He was deep in his own world of despair and purpose tangled together in a titanic struggle. While Shota had told him a great deal about the blood beast that was hunting him, Nietzsche had already told him that he was being hunted by a beast conjured at Jagang's behest. The visit to Shota had not been worth the minutiae he learned about the beast. It was the precious few things that Shota had said at the end that really mattered to him. It was those things for which he had traveled to this place. It was for those things he had paid a price so dear that he was only now beginning to fully grasp its significance. His fingers itched to touch the hilt of his sword for reassurance, but that familiar and faithful weapon was no longer there. He tried not to think about it, and yet he could think of little else. He felt relief that he had gained what he felt sure would be crucial information but at the same time he felt a crushing sense of personal failure. He paid only enough attention to where he was walking to keep from stepping on a yellow and black banded snake he spotted coiled in the lap of a root, or letting the fuzzy spiders clinging to the underside of leaves silently slide down silken lines to alight on him. He skirted brush when something within hissed at him. Richard followed the darkening trail as fast as safely possible, while in his mind he went over Shota's every word, concentrating on the treasure for which he had paid such a terrible price. Kara followed close on his heels, swinging and swatting at the cloud of bugs hovering around their faces. Occasionally a bat fluttered in out of the dark shadows to snatch up some of those bugs. As he made his way through the tangle of growth, Richard pushed aside vines and branches and stepped carefully around snarls of roots, some of which writhed like a nest of snakes when they got too close. On his first visit, Samuel had shown him how those roots could grab an ankle if you got too close. Richard was so totally absorbed in trying to figure out what chain fire could possibly mean or what it could be that he nearly stepped into a stretch of black water that was hard to see in the murky light. 
Kara's hand snatching his arm halted him just in time. He glanced around and spotted the log they had crossed on before and took to that route. He racked his brain trying to think if he had ever heard the word chain fire before, but his hopes grew as dim as the failing light. It was a strange enough word, it seemed, that he would have remembered it if he had ever heard it before. He wished that Shota would have known its source or meaning, but he believed that she was telling the truth about these kinds of answers coming to her without explanation or insight. On the other hand, he feared that he knew all too well what Shota meant when she'd said, what you seek is long buried. That warning made his chest ache. He dreaded that it very well might mean that Kalin was already dead and long ago buried. He'd felt lost ever since that morning he awoke to find her missing. Without Kalin, everything else in the world seemed meaningless. He couldn't allow himself to envision her death as being true. Instead, he thought about her beautiful, intelligent green eyes, her special smile, her singular manner as being very real and very alive. Shota's words, though, kept returning to him. He had to figure out what meaning they could hold if he was to find Kalin. The last part, that he should beware the viper with four heads, had made no sense to him at first. But the more he mulled it over, the more it began to feel to him like he should understand it, as if it was something that should make sense to him, or something he should be able to figure out if he just thought about it hard enough. The implication that seemed obvious was that this four-headed viper, whatever it was, was somehow responsible for Kalin's disappearance. He wondered if he only suspected that because it sounded sinister. He didn't want to allow himself to start down the wrong roads on groundless impulses. That would only waste valuable time. He feared that he had already used too much time. Where are we going? Kara asked lifting him out of his snare of thoughts. He realized that it was the first thing she had said since leaving Shota, to get the horses. You intend to try to make it over the pass tonight? Richard nodded. Yes, if we can. If the storm has blown away, the moon will provide enough light. The first time he had come to see Shota, the witch woman had taken Kalin back to her valley. Richard had followed their tracks over the pass at night. It wasn't easy, but he knew it could be done. He knew how tired he was from the hard day of crossing the pass, and he knew that Kara had to be just as tired, but he didn't intend to stop so long as he could still put one foot in front of the other. It was obvious by the set of Kara's jaw that she didn't like the idea of making such a journey at night, but instead of objecting, she asked something else. And when we get the horses? Then where? to try to get answers to what I've found out so far. All around, the mist had slowly drifted in among the gnarled trees, hanging vines, and expanses of still water, as if it were coming closer to listen in on their conversation. There was no wind to move the trailers of moss, so they hung limp from crooked branches. Shadows moved in the dark places beneath vines and brush. Unseen things distantly splashed, in the black stretches of stagnant water. Richard didn't really want to discuss the long and difficult ride ahead of them, so before Kara could say anything, he asked, Have you ever heard the word chain fire? Kara let out a sigh. No. Any guesses at all about what it could mean? She shook her head. What about the place of the bones in the deep nothing? Does that mean anything to you? Kara didn't answer for a moment. It seems like the deep nothing might be vaguely familiar, like I might have heard it once before. Richard thought that that sounded encouraging. Can you recall where, or anything about it? No, I'm afraid not. She reached out and casually plucked a heart-shaped leaf from a vine as she walked beside him. The only thing I can think is that maybe I heard it as a child. I've tried and tried, but I just can't recall if that's really true, that I might have heard it, or it's just that deep and nothing are common enough words, and so that's the reason it seems like I must know them. 
Richard let out a disappointed sigh. That was what he wondered, too, if they were simply common words, and that was what was making the deep nothing sound like maybe he should know it. What about a viper with four heads, he asked. Kara shook her head again as she dropped back a step to fall in behind him in order to skirt a tree limb hanging over into the trail. A small leaf-green snake was curled on the branch, watching them pass close by, licking the air for the scent of them. It makes no sense to me, she said as she twirled the leaf by its stem. I've never heard of such a beast, or whatever it is. Maybe the four-headed viper lives in a place called the Deep Nothing. Richard had considered that possibility himself, but because of the way Shota mentioned them separately, he doubted it. They had seemed to come to her as individual, distinctly different pieces of information. He supposed that since they were connected to his question about something that could help him discover the truth, they could be associated as Kara had suggested. At the place in the trail where the trees opened up to the dark mass of the mountains rising up before them, Kara paused. Maybe Nietzsche will catch up with us soon. She knows a lot about magic and all sorts of things. She might know what chain fire means, or even some of the rest of it. Nietzsche would be happy to do anything to help you. Richard hooked a thumb behind his belt. Do you want to tell me what you and Nietzsche have cooked up? It seemed rather obvious to him, but he wanted to hear her admit the extent of it. He watched her eyes as he waited. Nietzsche had nothing to do with it. It was my idea. What exactly was your idea? Kara turned away from his direct gaze and stared off up the pass. The sky was mostly clear, with stars beginning to appear. Ragged clouds scudded past on the silent wind higher up. It wouldn't be long before the moon rose. When you healed me, I felt some of the terrible loneliness haunting you. I think that you may have thought up this woman, Kaelin, in order to fill that void. I don't want you to have to suffer the terrible anguish I sensed in you. Someone who does not exist can't ever fill such a void. When she didn't say anything else, he did. And so you want that void to be filled by Nietzsche? She looked back to his eyes, frustration overtaking her features. Lord Raal, I only wanted to help you. I think you need someone to be with you, to share your life, like Shota wanted someone, like she wanted you. But Shota is the wrong person for both of you. I think Nietzsche would be good for you, that's all. So you thought that in my place you could give my heart away to someone? Well, it sounds wrong the way you put it. It is wrong. No, it's not, she insisted as her hands fisted at her sides. You need someone. I know that right now you feel lost. I think you're getting worse. Dear spirits, you just gave up your sword. You need someone. I know you do. You seem somehow incomplete. In all the time I've known you, you have never seemed that way to me before. My whole life I've never before thought of the Lord Raal as being with just one woman, much less being married. But with you, it just seems that you need a soulmate. Nietzsche is a better fit than anyone else. She's smart. Nietzsche is smart enough that you two can really talk. You share things about magic and such. I've seen the way you two talk, the way you both smile. You'll just look natural together. You're both smart and both gifted. And she's beautiful. You should have someone beautiful, and Nietzsche is that. And what part did Nietzsche play in your little plot? Nietzsche had much the same objections you have, which in a way only proves that I'm right about you two being such a good fit. So she didn't like you planning her life either? Kara shrugged one shoulder. No, that's not what I mean. She had the same objections for you. She spoke up on your behalf, not hers. She only cared about what you wanted. She seemed to know that you would take a dim view of such an idea. Well, you're right about one thing. She is smart. I was only trying to get her to think about it. I wasn't telling her to throw herself at you. I thought that maybe you two could complete each other, fill the void you both feel. 
I thought that maybe if I encouraged her to consider it, that nature could take its course, that's all. Richard wanted to strangle her, but he kept his voice calm because Kara's actions, while wrong, were so touchingly human, so caring, that at the same time he wanted to hug her. Who would have ever thought that a moored Sith could ever care about love and companionship? He guessed that he had, but still. Kara, what you're trying to do is the same thing Shota was trying to do. Decide for me what I should feel, how I should live. No, it's not the same. Richard's brow drew down. And how is it not the same? Kara pressed her lips together. He waited. She finally answered in a whisper. She doesn't really love you. I do. But not that way, she was quick to add. Richard wasn't in the mood to argue or to yell. He knew that Kara's intent was well-meaning, if misguided. More than anything, he could hardly believe what he had just heard her admit out loud. Were it not for everything else going on, he would have been overjoyed. Kara, I'm married to the woman I love. She sadly shook her head. Lord Rall, I'm sorry, but Kaelin just doesn't exist. If she doesn't exist, then why was Shota able to give me clues that will help me prove the truth? Kara looked away again. Because the truth is that there is no Kaelin. The things she told you will only help you discover that sad truth. Did you ever think of that? Only in my nightmares, he said, as he started for the mountain pass. Chapter 44 Jillian turned and gazed up into the sky when she heard the raven croak. The great bird's widespread wings rocked as it rode the invisible currents in the perfectly clear blue sky. As she watched, it croaked again, a harsh grating sound that echoed through the deep silence of chasms and carried out across the parched rolling landscape baking in the afternoon sun. Jillian snatched up the small dead lizard lying on the crumbling wall beside her and then scrambled up the dusty lane. The raven wheeled majestically overhead as he watched her running up the rise. She knew that he had probably seen her ages ago, long before she knew he had been there. Holding the lizard by its tail as she rose up on the balls of her feet, Jillian lifted her arm as high as she could toward the sky and wiggled the offering. She laughed when she saw the inky black bird look almost as if it stumbled in midair when it spotted the ringed lizard dangling from her fingers. The bird rolled into a steep dive with its wings pulled partly in to enable it to gather speed as it plummeted. Jillian hopped up and sat on the dilapidated stone wall beside some of the exposed paving stones that had once been part of a road. Over eons, much of that road had been buried beneath layers of dirt. Atop those layers of wind and rain-borne soil, wild grasses and scraggly trees now grew. Her grandfather had told her that this was part of a special place, and very old. Jillian had trouble imagining how old it could be. When she'd been younger, and had asked grandfather if it was older than him, he had laughed and said that while he admitted to being old, he was nowhere near that old, and that the ground did not in a single lifetime so swiftly cover over the accomplishments of man. He said that such slow work required not only time, but neglect. There had been plenty of time, and with virtually no people left, neglect had worked its ways. Grandfather had told her how this empty, ancient city had once been inhabited by their ancestors. Jillian loved to hear his stories about the mysterious people who had once lived in this place and had built the incredible city up on the headland beyond the stone spires. Her grandfather was a teller, and, since she was always so eager to hear his tellings of the old lore, he said that if she was willing to put in the effort, he would make her the teller who would one day take his place. Jillian was excited at the prospect of learning to be a teller and mastering all the things there was to learn. Someone respected for their knowledge of the ancient times and their heritage, but at the same time, 
She didn't like the implication that such an eventual advancement among her people would mark her grandfather's passing. Loki alighted next to her and folded in his glossy black wings, bringing her out of her consideration of weighty subjects, of ancient people and the cities they built, of wars and great deeds. The curious raven waddled closer. Jillian set down the freshly dead lizard and, holding the tip of its tail, wiggled it temptingly. Loki cocked his head, watching. Instead of taking the offering, he blinked his black eyes. He waddled closer to her, leading with his right foot in the cautious sideways manner he always used when approaching carrion. Rather than flapping his wings and hopping back several times in the guarded practice he employed when coming upon what he hoped would be a meal but could potentially turn into a threat, he stepped boldly forward and snatched her buckskin sleeve in his heavy bill. Loki, what are you doing? Loki tugged insistently. The curious bird usually plucked at the beads down the sleeve of the leather thongs at the end, but now he pulled the sleeve itself. What? she asked. What do you want? He let go of her sleeve and cocked his head as he peered at her with one gleaming eye. Ravens were intelligent creatures, but she was never quite sure just how intelligent. Sometimes she thought that Loki was smarter than some people she knew. Loki's throat feathers and ears lifted out aggressively. He suddenly let out a piercing caw that sounded very much like angry frustration at not being able to talk so that he could tell her something. Craw! He fluffed out his feathers again and cawed again. Craw! Jillian stroked his head and then his back, scratching gently but firmly under his raised black plumage, something he loved to have done, before smoothing down his ruffled feathers. Instead of clicking contentedly and blinking lazily as he usually did when she gave him such a scratch, he hopped back a step out of her reach and let out three piercing caws that made her ears hurt. Craw! 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 She covered her ears. What's gotten into you today? Loki hopped up and down, flapping his wings. Craw! He ran across the top of the old cobble road, flapping and croaking. At the other side, he fluttered up into the air, alighted, and then lifted off the ground again. Craw! Jillian stood. You want me to come with you? Loki cawed noisily as if to confirm that she had at long last guessed correctly. Jillian laughed. She was sure that the crazy bird could understand every word she said and sometimes read her thoughts besides. She loved having him around. Sometimes, when she talked to him, he would quietly stand nearby and listen. Her grandfather had told her not to let Loki sleep in her room or he would know her dreams. Jillian mostly had wonderful dreams, so she didn't mind if Loki knew them. She suspected that maybe her friend did know her dreams, and that was why she often awoke to find him perched on the nearby window sill, sleeping contentedly. But she was always very careful not to send him any nightmares. Did you find yourself a nice dead antelope? Or maybe a rabbit? Is that why you're not hungry? She shook her finger at him. Loki, she scolded. Did you steal another raven's cash? Loki was always hungry. Her ravenous raven, she often called him. He would share her dinner with her if she would let him, and steal it if she wouldn't. Even if he was too full to eat the lizard, she was surprised that he didn't at least take it away and hide it for later. Ravens hid whatever they couldn't manage to eat, and they could eat a lot. She couldn't understand how it was that the bird didn't get fat. Jillian stood and brushed the dust from the seat of her dress and her knobby knees. Loki was already airborne, circling, cawing, urging her to hurry. All right, all right, she complained as she held her arms out for balance while scurrying along the top of the fat wall along an enclosure strewn with rubble. At the crest of the small hill, she stood with one hand on the sash of cloth wrapped around her hip, while with her other hand she shielded her eyes as she peered up into the bright sky to watch her friend pitching and rolling in a bid to keep her attention. 
Loki was a shameless show-off. If he couldn't do aerial stunts to impress other ravens, he would happily do them for her. Yes, she yelled into the sky. You're a clever bird, Loki. Loki cawed once and then swiftly beat his wings. Jillian's gaze followed him, her hand shielding her eyes from the sunlight as he flew south out over the vast expanse before her. Random ribbons of green summer grasses up closer to the foot of the headland and mountains behind her cut through the barren landscape. To the sides, hazy violet fingers of distant mountains, each farther one a shade softer and lighter, extended down into the desolate plain that seemed to go south forever. She knew it didn't, though. Grandfather said that to the south was a great barrier, and beyond a long forbidden place called the Old World. In the distance, down among the green patches on the plain that lay close up against the foothills, she could see the place where her people lived in the summers. Wooden fences filled the broken gaps in ancient stone walls that held their goats, pigs, and chickens. Some of their cattle grazed out on the summer grasses. There was water in this place, and some trees, their leaves shimmering in the bright sunlight. Gardens stretched out beside the simple brick houses that had withstood the harsh winter winds and baking summer sun for untold centuries. And then, when she glanced up again at Loki, Jillian saw at the horizon toward the west a faint cloud of dust rising up. It was so far away that it seemed tiny. The smudge of dust against the deep blue of the sky where it met the horizon seemed to hang in the air, motionless. But she knew that it was just a trick of the distance that made it look tiny and still. Even from this far, she was able to tell that it was spread across a broad swath. It was still so far away that it was hard to see much of its cause. Had it not been for Loki, Jillian likely wouldn't have spotted it for some time. Even though she couldn't yet see what was causing the dust, she knew that she had never before seen such a sight. Her first thought was that it had to be a whirlwind or a dust storm. But as she watched it, she realized that it was too broad to be a whirlwind, and a dust storm didn't stream up into the sky the way this did. A dust storm, even if it did extend high up, still had at the base what looked like huge billowing brown clouds running along the ground that was actually where the gusty winds were churning up the dust. This wasn't at all like that. This was dust rising up from something coming, from people coming on horses. Strangers. More strangers than she could fathom, strangers in such numbers that it was like something in her grandfather's stories. Jillian's knees began to tremble. Fear welled up through her, coming to lodge in her throat where screams were born. This was them. The strangers her grandfather always said would come. They were coming now. People never doubted her grandfather, to his face anyway, but she didn't think they really worried about the things in his tellings. After all, their lives were peaceful. No one ever came to disturb them or their homeland. Jillian, though, had always believed her grandfather, and so she'd always known that the strangers would eventually come. But like other people, she'd always thought it would be some time in the dim future, maybe when she was old, or maybe even, if they were lucky, generations in the future. It was only in her infrequent nightmares that the strangers arrived in the present rather than the far future. Seeing those columns of dust rising, she knew without a doubt that this was them, and they were coming now. In her whole life, she had never seen strangers. No one but Jillian's people ever wandered the inhospitable barrens of the vast and forbidding place known as the Deep Nothing. She stood trembling in terror, staring at the smudge of dust at the horizon. She was about to see a great many outsiders, the ones from the stories. But it was too soon. She hadn't had a life yet, hadn't had a chance to live and love and have children. Tears brimmed in her eyes, giving everything a watery appearance. She looked over her shoulder and up into the ruins. Was this what they had faced, like in grandfather's tellings? Tears began to run down through the dust on her cheeks. 
she knew, she knew without a hint of doubt that her life was about to change and that her dreams would no longer be happy. Jillian scrambled down off the top of the rubble she had been standing on and ran down the hill past the wall, the crumbled empty squares of brick buildings, the pits where once buildings had risen up. Her racing feet raised their own cloud of dust as she ran through the ruins of what once had been outposts of an ancient city. She ran down roads that no longer had life around them, no longer were lined with standing buildings. She had often tried to imagine what it would have been like when people had lived in the houses, when people had walked the streets, cooked in the homes, hung the wash outside their brick houses, traded goods in the squares. No more. They were all long dead. The whole city was long dead, except for the few of Jillian's people who sometimes stayed in the most remote of the old buildings. As she got closer to those ancient buildings of the outposts that they used when they lived in this area for the summer, Jillian saw people hurrying about, yelling to one another. She saw that they were gathering up their things and collecting the animals. It appeared they were going to move on, maybe back into the shelter of the mountains or out onto the barrens. She had seen her people do such a thing only a few times before. The threat had always turned out to be imaginary. Jillian knew that this time it was real. She wasn't sure, though, if they would have enough time to flee the approaching strangers and hide. But her people were strong and swift. They were used to moving around on the empty land. Grandfather said that no one else but her people could survive so well in this forsaken place. They knew the mountain passes and places of water, as well as the hidden passages through what seemed like impassable canyons. They could vanish into the inhospitable land in short order and survive. Most of them could, anyway. Some, like her grandfather, were no longer swift. With that renewed fear, her feet ran all the faster, padding with a steady beat over the dusty ground. As she got closer, Jillian saw men packing their travel goods on the mules. Women collected cooking utensils, filled water containers, and carried clothes and tents out from their summer homes and storage buildings. It looked to Jillian that they had been aware of the approaching strangers for some time, as they were already well advanced in their preparations to depart. Ma! Jillian called out when she saw her mother packing her pot atop a mule already piled high with their belongings. Ma! Her mother flashed a quick smile and held out a sheltering arm. Even though she was getting past the age for such things, Jillian nuzzled under that arm like a chick burrowing under a mother hen's wing. Jillian, get your things, her mother shooed her with a hand. Hurry! Jillian knew better than to question at a time like this. She wiped away her tears and ran to the small, square, ancient building they used as their home when they summered on the plains near the headland. The men sometimes had to replace the roofs when the worst of the weather tore them off, but other than that, the rest of the stout, squat buildings were the very same buildings constructed by their ancestors who had once built and lived in the deserted city of Casca up on the headland. Grandfather, looking drawn and pale as she imagined a ghost might look, waited in the shadows just inside the door. He was not hurrying. Terror swelled in Jillian's chest. He realized that she couldn't come with him. He was old and frail. Like some of the other older people, he wouldn't be swift enough to keep up with the rest of them if they were to escape. She could see in his eyes that he had no intention of trying. She sank into her grandfather's tender embrace and started wailing, even as he comforted her. There, there, child, he said, his hand stroking her short-cropped hair. No time for this. Grandfather grasped her arms and eased her away as she tried her best to bring her sobbing under control. She knew that she was old enough that she shouldn't be crying in such a way, but she just couldn't help it. He squatted down, his leathery face wrinkling as he smiled at her and brushed away a tear. Jillian swiped away the rest of her tears, trying to be strong and act her age. Grandfather, 
Loki showed me the strangers who are coming. He was nodding. I know, I sent him. Oh, was all she could think to say. Her world was turning upside down and it was hard to think, but somewhere in the back of her mind, she realized that he had never before done such a thing. She'd never known he could, but knowing her grandfather, it didn't really surprise her. Jillian, listen to me. These men who are coming are the ones I always told you would come. Those who can are going away for a while to hide. For how long? For as long as necessary. These men who ride this way are only a small number of those who will eventually come. Her eyes grew wide. You mean there are more? But there are so many. They raise more dust than I have ever seen before. There can be more strangers than these? His smile was brief and bitter. These are only a survey party, I expect. The first advance scouts of many more to come. This vast and desolate land is unknown to them. I expect they are looking for routes through it, testing to see if there will be any opposition. I'm afraid that according to the tellings, the men they scout for are more in number than even I can grasp. I believe that these other men, with their uncountable numbers, are yet some time in coming. But even this advance party will be dangerous, ruthless men. Those of our people who are able must flee and hide for now. Jillian, you cannot go with them. Her jaw dropped. What? Listen to me. The times I have told you about are upon us. But Ma and Pa won't allow... They will allow what I tell them they must, just as our people must, he said in a stern voice. This is about far greater matters, matters that have never before involved our people, at least not since our ancestors filled the city. Now these things concern us as well. Jillian nodded solemnly. Yes, Grandfather. She was terror-stricken but at the same time she felt an awakening sense of duty to her grandfather's call. If he intended to trust her with such things, then she could not fail him. What is it I am to do then? You are to be the priestess of the bones, the carrier of dreams. Jillian's mouth again fell open. Me? Yes, you. But I'm still too young. I've not been trained in such things. There is no more time, child. He leaned toward her in admonition. You are the one to do this, Jillian. I have already taught you much of the tellings. You may think you are unprepared, or that you are not old enough, and all that may have some truth to it. But you know more than you may realize. What's more, there is no other. It is upon you to do this. Jillian couldn't seem to make herself blink. She felt completely inadequate, and at the same time faintly excited and guardedly inspired. Her people were depending on her. More importantly, her grandfather was depending on her, and he believed she could do it. Yes, grandfather. I will prepare you to be among the dead, and then you must hide among them and wait. Fear began to wrap its arms around her again. She had never stayed all alone among the dead. Jillian swallowed. Grandfather, are you sure that I'm ready for such a thing? To be there alone among the dead, waiting for one of them? The light coming in from the open door cast his face with a forbidding look. You are as ready as I can make you. I had hoped there would be time left to teach you many more things, but at least I have taught you some of what you must know. Outside, people rushed around in the sunlight, tending to the preparations. They were careful not to look into the shadows to Grandfather after he had pulled her away from the rest of them, telling her what she must face. To tell you the truth, he said, this has taken me unprepared as well. The tellings have been carried down from our people for thousands of years, but they never said when it would happen. I never really believed that it would come during my life. I remember my own grandfather telling me the things I have told you, 
and not really believing it would ever happen except maybe in some far future time that didn't really mean anything to my life. But the time is now upon us, and we must do our best to honor our ancestors. We must be ready. You must, as we have been taught through the tellings. How long will I have to wait? There is no way I can tell you that. You must hide among the spirits. As the tellers have done down through the centuries, you and I have stashed food as Loki does for just such an eventuality. You will have food to keep your belly full. You can fish and hunt for game when it is safe to be out. Yes, Grandfather. But couldn't you hide with me? I will take you up there, help prepare you, and tell you all I can. But I must then return here to help make these strangers think we are out in the open and welcoming to them while the others of our people escape, and so that you will be able to hide. I could not be as swift as you, nor as small to slip through the narrow places so that these men cannot follow you. I will have to return here and do my part. What if the strangers hurt you? Grandfather took a breath and let it out with weary resolve. It may be that they do so. These men who come will be capable of such brutality. That is why this is so important. Their cruel ways are why we must be strong and why we must not give in to them. Even if I die, he shook a finger at her, and you can be sure that I will do my best not to. I will be buying the rest of you the time you need. Jillian chewed on her lip. Aren't you afraid to die? He nodded as he smiled. Very. But I have lived a long life, and because I love you so, I would choose that you have a chance to do the same. Grandfather, she said through choking tears, I want you to be with me for my life. He took her hand. Me too, child. I wish to see you grow into a woman and have your own children but I don't want you to worry too much for me. I am not so helpless, nor a fool. I will sit in the shade with the others and present no threat to these men. We will confess to the strangers that the younger of our people ran away in terror, but we could not. The strangers will likely have more important things to do than waste their energy harming us. We will be fine. I want you to think about what you must do and not worry about me. Jillian felt a little better about his safety. Yes, Grandfather. Besides, he told her, Loki will be with you, and he will carry my spirit with him, so it will be almost like I am watching over you. When she smiled at that, he said, Come now, we must go and make preparations. Jillian's mother and father were allowed a brief farewell after Grandfather told them in a stern voice that he was taking her to be with their spirit ancestors and see to the safety of their people. Her mother and father either understood the importance of allowing their daughter to go or were too afraid of Grandfather to refuse. In either case, they hugged her and bid her strength until they could be together again. Without speaking more of it, Grandfather led her away as eyes followed them. He took her up the ancient roads and through gorges, past the deserted outposts and mysterious buildings, and up the great rise of the land. As they climbed, the sun lowered in the western sky behind the golden tail of dust that slowly but steadily came ever closer. She knew that before the sun set, most of her people would be gone. The lowering sun allowed the murky shadows to begin to haunt the defiles. The smooth stone, layered with twisting bands of rock, invited them ever onward to see what might be around each curving bend. Along the bottom, the gravel was littered here and there with bones of small animals. Most, she knew, were the leavings of the coyotes and the wolves. She tried very hard to banish the mental image of her own bleached bones lying scattered in the gravel. Overhead, Loki lazily circled in the deepening blue of the sky as he watched her making her way with Grandfather up toward the headland. When they reached the stone spires, 
the bird silently glided among the column's pinnacles as if it were a game. He had followed them up to the ancient city enough times that he must have thought nothing of it. To Jillian, even though Grandfather had taken her up through the maze of ravines, gullies, and deep canyons a great many times, this time it all seemed new to her. This time she was going as the priestess of the bones, the carrier of dreams. At a place where a quiet stream followed a twisting route through the graveled bottom of a very deep canyon, Grandfather led her to a small boulder in the cool shade and sat her down. All around, the smooth, undulating sides of the canyon rose nearly straight up, leaving no way to climb out if a sudden rain brought a flood. It was a dangerous place, for more than the reason of the threat of flash floods. It was a tangle of side gullies and canyons that in places took complicated routes around huge standing columns so that it was possible to go around in circles and never find your way out. Jillian, though, knew her way through this labyrinth as well as others. As she sat quietly, waiting, Grandfather opened a pouch he always carried tied to his belt. He pulled out a folded piece of oilcloth from among the things he carried in the pouch and opened it in one palm. He dipped his first finger in the oily black substance inside. Grandfather lifted her chin. Hold still now while I paint your face. Jillian had never been painted before. She knew of the formality from Grandfather's stories, but she just never thought about it being her who would be the priestess of the bones, the one to be painted. She sat as still as she could while he worked, feeling that everything was happening too fast before she had even had time to really think about it. Earlier that day, the most she had on her mind was catching a lizard for Loki. Now it felt as if the weight of the world was on her shoulders. There, Grandfather said, come see. Jillian knelt beside a still pool and bent forward. She gasped. What she saw was frightening. The face staring back had a painted black band across it, like a blindfold, but one she could see through. Her copper-colored eyes stared back at her from the dark midst of that smoky black mask. Now the evil spirits will not be able to see you, he told her as he stood. You can safely be among our ancestors. Jillian stood as well, feeling very strange indeed. She felt transformed. The face she'd seen had been the face of the priestess. She'd heard about it in grandfather's tellings, but she'd never seen such a face in real life, much less expected it to ever be her own. She leaned over and stole a cautious peek into the still pool. This will truly hide me? It will keep you safe, he said as he nodded. She wondered if Loki would know her, if he would be afraid of her. The face staring back from the still water certainly scared her. Come, Grandfather said. We must get you up there, and then I must get back so the men will find me there with those of our people who remain behind. When at long last they climbed out of the spires and stone canyons, they were finally up near the city, just outside the great main wall, but within some of the outer rings of smaller walls. They had emerged near the graveyard. Grandfather gestured. You lead the way, Jillian. This is your place now. Jillian nodded and started out toward the city glowing in the golden late day sunlight. It was a beautiful sight, as it always was, but this day it also seemed haunting to her. It seemed she was seeing it through new eyes. She felt a very real connection with her ancestors now. The grand buildings looked as if people might still occupy them, as if she might spot some of them through the empty window openings as they went about their daily lives. Some of the structures were immense, with soaring pillars holding up projecting sections of slate roofs. Other buildings had rows of arched windows on each level. Grandfather had taken her into some of those buildings. It was amazing to see places that were stacked inside with layers of rooms so that one had to climb stairs, stairs actually built right inside the buildings to get to rooms above. 
The ancient builders seemed almost magical in the things they had accomplished. From a distance, glowing in the golden light, it truly was a majestic sight. Now she would walk the streets alone, accompanied only by the spirits of those who had once lived here. She felt safe, though, knowing that Grandfather had painted upon her the mask of the Priestess of the Bones. She would be the one who would cast the dreams at the strangers. If she did her job well, the strangers would be so frightened that they would flee and her people would be safe. She tried not to think about how the people who once had lived here had done the same thing and yet had failed. Do you think there will be too many? she asked, suddenly frightened by the tellings of the ancient debacle. Too many. He puzzled at her as they walked beside a wall that had long ago been encased by living nets of vines that now held the crumbling stones in place. Too many for the dreams. I'm only one person and I'm not experienced or older or anything. It's just me. His big hand gave her an assuring pat between her shoulder blades. Numbers do not matter. He will help give you the strength you need. Grandfather lifted a cautionary finger. And don't forget, Jillian, the tellings say that you must be devoted to this one. He is to be your master. Jillian nodded as they entered the vast graveyard. In the lower reaches, there were simple stone markers. As they climbed higher past row upon row of graves, they eventually came to larger and more ornate monuments to the dead. Some of them had grand statues of people in proud poses atop them. Some had carvings of the flame of life that represented the Creator's light. Some had ancient inscriptions of lasting love a few had only an ancient symbol on them that her grandfather told her was called a grace. Some of the great monuments had only a name. Deep in the place of the dead, near the highest spot where the weathered trees grew large and twisted, they came at last to a grand grave marked with a huge, ornately crafted stone monument. Atop it sat a speckled gray granite urn that held olives, pears, and other fruits, with grapes spilling out over one side, all carved from the same piece of stone. Grandfather, who had taken her to see this monument many times as he gave her tellings, said that the urn was meant to represent the bounty of life that man created through his creative efforts and hard work. He watched her as she paused, and then stepped closer to a huge gravestone for someone long dead carved from one piece of stone back in the time that the ancient city had been alive. She wondered what he had been like. She wondered if he had been kind or cruel or young or old. Loki alighted atop the carved stone grapes and ruffled his glossy black feathers before settling himself. She was glad that Loki would keep her company in such a lonely place. Jillian reached out and traced a finger through the letters that spelled out the name carved in the gray granite. Do you think the tellings are true, Grandfather? I mean, really true? I was taught that they are. Then he really will come back to us from the world of the dead? Really, truly come back to life from the dead? She looked back over her shoulder. Her grandfather, standing close behind her, reached out and reverently touched the stone monument. He nodded solemnly. He will. Then I will wait for him, she said. The priestess of the bones will be here to welcome him and serve him when he returns to life. Jillian briefly glanced at the dust rising at the horizon and then turned back to the tomb. Please hurry, she implored of the dead man. As her grandfather watched, she gently ran her small fingers through the bold letters on the tomb. I can't cast the dreams without you, Jillian said softly to the name carved in the stone. Please hurry, Richard Rall, and return to the living. Chapter 45 As Nietzsche's horse, Sardine, stepped through the empty city, 
The clop of his hooves on the stone cobbles echoed among the canyons of deserted buildings like a forlorn call that went unanswered. Colorful shutters stood open on some of the windows, closed on others. On the second floor of many of the buildings, tiny balconies overlooking the empty streets had wrought iron railings standing in front of doors with drapes pulled tightly closed. There was no breeze to move the legs of a pair of pants Nietzsche saw hanging on a line strung between the second floors on opposite sides of an empty alleyway. The owner of the pants had long ago walked off without them. The quiet was so imposing that it bordered on ominous. It was an eerie feeling being within a city without its people, the mere shell that had once held life and vitality, now with form but no purpose. It was somewhat reminiscent of viewing a corpse, the way that it seemed so nearly alive and yet so still that there could be no doubt as to the terrible truth. If left this way, if not brought back from the cold brink with life, it would eventually crumble into forgotten ruins. Through narrow gaps between buildings, Nietzsche caught glimpses of the wizard's keep embedded in a rocky slope high up on the monstrous mountain. The vast, dark complex perched like a menacing vulture ready to pick over the remains of the silent city. Spires, towers, and high bridges rising up from the keep snagged clouds, slowly drifting past the sheer, fractured face of the rock. The immense edifice was as sinister a sight as she had ever seen. Still, she knew that in reality it wasn't a sinister place, and she was relieved to at last have arrived. It had been a long and difficult journey from the old world up to Adendril. There had been times when she had feared she would never be able to escape the snares of troops strung out along the way. There had been times when she had for a time lost herself in killing them. There were so many, though, that she knew she had no realistic hope of making any meaningful reduction in their numbers. It had enraged her that she could be little more than a pest to them. Still, her real purpose had been to reach Richard. The ordered troops were merely an obstacle in her way. Through the conjured connection she had forged with Richard, Nietzsche knew that she was at long last near to him. She hadn't found him yet, but she knew she soon would. For a time, before she had even started on her way, she had come to think that she would never again have a chance to see him. The fighting for control of al Turang had been brutal. The troops who had attacked, having been surprised and bloodied in the beginning as evening had fallen, being as experienced and battle-hardened as they were, had quickly gathered their wits and their numbers, and, by the light of fires they'd set, made a concentrated effort to turn the tide of battle. Even with as much as Nietzsche knew about the manner in which Jagang would deal with the insurrection in al Turang, even she didn't expect all that he had thrown at them. For a time, with the help of an unexpected third wizard, it had seemed that the order troops would overpower the inexperienced defenders. It was a darkly hopeless moment when it appeared that the efforts of the people of al Turang to defend themselves were to be for naught. The specter of failure and the ensuing slaughter everyone knew such a failure would bring came to seem not only inevitable but all too real. For a time, Nietzsche and those with her believed they would not survive the night. Despite her wounds and exhaustion, and even more than her sincere desire to help the people she knew in all Turang and all the innocent and helpless souls who would be slaughtered if they lost, the thought of never seeing Richard again had galvanized Nietzsche and given her the extra strength of will to push on. She used her fear of never seeing Richard again to ignite a fierce rage that could only be quenched with the blood of the enemy who stood in her way. At the crucial point in the battle, in the harsh, flickering light of the roaring blazes from buildings burning all around, as the enemy wizard stood on the platform of a public well in an open square, casting death and ghastly suffering as he urged his men onward, Nietzsche appeared like an avenging spirit in the midst of their ranks and bounded up onto the platform. It was an event so unexpected 
that it caught the attention of everyone. In that brief fraction of time when they all stared in stunned surprise in full view of the order troops, she abruptly cleaved the chest of their astonished wizard and with her bare hands ripped out his still beating heart. With a cry of primal anger, Nietzsche held the bloody trophy up for his soldiers to see and promised them the same. At that moment, Victor Casella charged with his men into the center of the invaders. He was gripped by rage of his own. Not just that the marauding thugs would murder and pillage the people of Alturang, but that they would steal his hard-won liberty. Had he the gift, his fierce glare alone might have cut down the enemy. As it was, his bold attack was as unexpected as it was ferocious. That combination of events broke the courage of the attackers. None of them wanted to face the wrath of the blacksmith and fall under the fury of his mace any more than they wanted a mad sorceress who seemed like the avenging spirit of death itself to rip out their hearts. The elite order troops turned and tried to escape from the city, from the middle of an enraged populace. Rather than let the people of the city be satisfied with victory, Nietzsche had insisted that the enemy be pursued and killed to a man. She alone fully understood how important it was that none of the soldiers escaped to tell the tale of their loss. Emperor Jagang would be awaiting word that his home city had been brought back under his command, that the insurrectionists had been tortured to death, and that the people of the city had been driven to their knees, that there was such slaughter that it would for all time serve as a warning for others. Even though he expected success, Nietzsche knew that Jagang would have taken word of the defeat in stride. He had lost battles before. It did not deter him. From losses, he learned the measure of the opposition. He would have simply sent more troops the next time, enough to accomplish the task, and to do so as viciously as possible, not only to ensure victory, but to ensure an extra measure of punishment for resisting his authority. Nietzsche knew the man. He did not care about the lives of his soldiers or the lives of anyone for that matter. If men fought for the order and died, then glory in the afterlife would be their reward. They could expect only sacrifice in this life. But if no word of the battle for all to a wrong ever arrived, that was something altogether different. Nietzsche knew that Jagang was nettled by lack of knowledge more than any enemy. He did not like the unknown. She knew that sending off crack troops, along with three rare and valuable wizards, and then never again hearing another word from any of them, would gall him no end. He would work the mystery over and over in his mind, the way a nervous man worked a worry stone in his fingers. In the end, not having any testimony whatsoever as to the outcome of the battle for al Rang would spook him more than a simple defeat. He did not fear losing men. Life meant little to him, so a defeat he could handle, but he didn't at all like the unknown. Perhaps worse, his army, composed of men prone to superstition, would take such an event as a bad omen. As Nietzsche followed the twisting turns of the narrow cobblestone street, she came around a curve and looked up to see, between the buildings lining each side, a sight that nearly took her breath away. On a hill in the distance, lit by the sun, set on a sweep of beautiful grounds of emerald green, stood a magnificent palace of white stone. It was as elegant as anything she had ever seen. It was a structure that stood proud, strong, and pleasingly possessed of a distinctly feminine grace. This, she knew, could be nothing other than the confessor's palace. The sight of it, exquisite, authoritative, pure, stood in stark contrast to the towering mountain behind it upon which rose the dark, soaring walls of the keep. It seemed clear to Nietzsche that the confessor's palace was meant to be majesty backed by dark threat. This had been, after all, the place that for millennia had ruled the Midlands, the larger lands of the Midlands had palaces in the city for their ambassadors and members of the Central Council, which had ruled the collective lands of the Midlands. The Mother Confessor reigned over not only the Confessors, but the Central Council as well. 
kings and queens answered to her, as did every ruler of every land of the Midlands. From the narrow street she was on, Nietzsche didn't see the palaces representing the various lands, but she knew that not a one of them would be as grand as the confessor's palace, especially not with the imposing keep as a backdrop. Through a gap in the buildings to the side, movement caught Nietzsche's attention. When she saw that it was dust rising into the still air, she laid the reins over and swung Sadin around, directing him down a side street. Squeezing her lower legs, she urged him into a canter. Without pause, he charged off down the narrow dirt street. In flashes between buildings, she could see the dust rising in the distance. Someone was riding at speed up a road toward the mountain where the keep stood. Through her link with him, she knew who it had to be. Nietzsche had helped end the threat to all to wrong as swiftly as possible, primarily so that she could be off after Richard. It wasn't that she didn't care about those people, or eliminating the animals sent to massacre them. It was just that she cared more about getting to Richard. At first, she had it in her mind to ride as fast as she could and catch up with him and Kara. It had quickly become apparent, however, that there was no chance of that. He was simply traveling too swiftly. When Richard was focused on a goal and determined to get to it, he was relentless. Nietzsche realized that her only hope of ever catching up with him again was, instead of chasing him, to head toward where he would go next and intercept him. She knew that the witch woman couldn't help him find a woman who didn't exist, so Nietzsche reasoned that Richard would next head north to try to get help from the only wizard he knew, his grandfather Zed, at the wizard's keep in Aidendrill. Since she'd still been a long way back to the southeast, Nietzsche had decided to take the shortest route to Aidendrill, thereby needing to cover much less distance than he would, and thus be able to intercept him there. As she broke out of the narrow confines of the buildings of the city, Nietzsche's heart quickened when she saw that she was right, when she finally saw Richard. He and Kara were charging up a road, pulling a long ribbon of dust behind them. Nietzsche recalled that they'd left all to a wrong with six horses, they now had only three. By the way they were riding, Nietzsche strongly suspected that she knew why. When Richard had his mind set on something, he was unstoppable. He had probably ridden the other horses to death. As Nietzsche galloped out of the city to cut them off, Richard immediately spotted her and slowed his pace. Sadin carried her swiftly over the small rises, past paddocks, stables, workshops, deserted market stands, a blacksmith's shop, and fenced pastures with buildings for animals that were no longer there. Stands of pine trees flashed past, and she raced under the broad crowns of white oaks crowded close to the road in places. Nietzsche couldn't wait to see Richard again. Her life suddenly had purpose again. She wondered if anything had happened with the witch woman to finally convince him that there was no woman from his dreams that he remembered as real. Nietzsche even held out some hope that he had recovered from his delusions and was now back to his old self. Her relief at seeing him sitting tall atop his horse overcame her concern as to why he would be racing for the keep. Since she had been separated from him, Nietzsche had gone over everything that had happened, trying to pinpoint the source of his delusion, and she had come to a frightening theory. Going over it a thousand times in her mind, trying to remember every detail, Nietzsche had come to fear that she had actually been the cause of his problem. She had been working at a rapid pace as she tried to save his life. There were other people around creating a distraction. She was worried that enemy soldiers would attack at any moment, and so she dared not slow what she was doing. Even worse, she was attempting things she had never done before, things she'd never even heard of before. After all, subtractive magic was used to rain ruin, not to heal. She was doing things she wasn't sure would work. She also knew that there was no other hope, and so she had no choice. But she feared that in that dangerous mix, she was the one who had accidentally induced the problem with Richard's memory, with his mind. If that was true, she would never forgive herself. 
If she had made a mistake with subtractive magic and had eliminated some element of his mind, some vital part that made him able to interact effectively with reality, there would be no way to restore such a loss. Eliminating something with subtractive magic was as irreversible as death. If she had damaged his mind, he would never again be the same, dwelling forever in a twilight world of his own imagination, never again able to recognize the truth of the world around him, and it would all be her fault. That thought had taken her to the edge of despair. Richard and Kara halted beside the road as they waited for Nietzsche to reach them. Fields of tall summer grass grew at the base of wooded hills beyond. Their horses took the opportunity to crop at that long grass where it came close to the side of the road. Page 459. The sight of Richard swelled Nietzsche's heart with joy. His hair was a little longer, and he looked dusty from the ride, but he looked as taut, as tall, as powerful, as handsome, as masterful, as incisive, as focused, as driven as he always looked. Like nothing in the world around him escaped his notice. Despite his simple and dusty travel clothes, he looked every inch the Lord Rahl himself. Still, it seemed there was something not right about him. Richard! Nietzsche called out as she raced up to him and Kara, even though they saw her. Nietzsche reined in Sadine as she reached them. Once she was stopped, the dust she had outpaced began to catch up and drift past. Richard and Kara waited. With the way Nietzsche had shouted, they looked like they expected her to say something urgent when it had been nothing more than her excitement at seeing him. I'm relieved to see that you're both well, Nietzsche said. Richard visibly relaxed and draped both hands over the pommel of his saddle. His horse shivered flies off its rump. Kara sat up straight in her saddle, her horse close and behind Richard's, tossing its head a little at how tightly she had him reined in after the gallop. I'm glad to see you looking well too, Richard said. His warm smile said that he meant it. Nietzsche could have bubbled over into joyous laughter at seeing that smile, but she restrained herself and simply returned it. How did it go in all Turang? he asked. Is the city safe? They destroyed the invaders. Nietzsche tightened the reins to settle down and excited Sadin. She gave his neck a reassuring pat to help calm him down. The city is safe for now. Victor and Ishak said to tell you that they are free and will stay that way. Richard nodded with quiet satisfaction. You're all right, then? I was worried about you. Fine, she said, unable to restrain her grin at the very idea that he had been worried for her and not the least bit interested in telling him about injuries that were now healed. None of that mattered anymore. She was with Richard again. He looked weary, as if he and Kara had not gotten much sleep on their journey north. By the distance they had covered in such a short time, they could not have rested much. Nietzsche then realized what it was that was wrong with him. He didn't have his sword. Richard, where's... Kara behind him flashed Nietzsche a forbidding look, and at the same time quickly drew a finger across her throat, warning Nietzsche to cut off what she had been about to ask. Where are the other horses? Nietzsche quickly asked altering the course of her question to cover over the ominous silence that had oozed up in the brief pause. Richard sighed, apparently not realizing the truth of what she had been about to ask. I'm afraid I've been pushing them pretty hard. A few of them came up lame and the rest died. We've had to get new horses along the way. These we stole from an imperial order encampment near Galia. They have troops billeted all over the Midlands, we helped ourselves to their horses and supplies along the way. Kara smiled with sly satisfaction, but remained silent. Nietzsche wondered how he had managed such things without his sword. She then realized how foolish such a thought was. The sword didn't make Richard the man he was. And the beast? Nietzsche asked. Richard glanced over his shoulder at Kara. We've had a few encounters. For some reason, 
Nietzsche sensed something disquieting in his voice, if not his words. A few encounters, she asked. What sort of encounters? What's the matter? What's wrong? We managed, that's all. We'll talk about it later when we have time. She could see by the irritable look in his eyes that he was understating it and was in no mood to have to relive it right then. He pulled the reins over, taking his horse's attention away from the grass. Right now I need to get up to the keep. And what of the witch woman? Nietzsche asked as she walked her horse alongside his. What did you find out? What did she say? That what I seek is long buried, he muttered dejectedly to himself. Richard wiped a weary hand across his face and then came out of his private thoughts to fix her in his penetrating gaze. Does the word chain fire mean anything to you? When Nietzsche shook her head, he asked, What about the deep nothing? Deep nothing? Nietzsche thought it over briefly. No, what is it? I have no idea, but I need to find out. I'm hoping Zed will be able to shed some light on it. Come on, let's get moving. With that, he galloped away. Nietzsche immediately urged Sardine into a gallop to keep up. Chapter 46 The road up to the keep offered magnificent views of the city of Aidendrill spread out below, even though clouds had slipped in over the mountains to mute the late afternoon light and leave the still air muggy. Were it not for her concerns, Nietzsche might have found the views from the road up to the keep to be one of the most beautiful vistas she had ever seen, and an appreciation of such beauty was something relatively new to her, something that Richard had awakened in her. As it was, though, she brooded over his continuing fixation on finding the woman Kalin that he was so sure he remembered. He hadn't said anything about her yet, probably because of their previous disagreements he had become frustrated by the futility of trying to convince her that he had to find a woman Nietzsche knew did not exist. Despite not mentioning her, it was clear to Nietzsche that he was no less determined to find Kalin now than he had been the last time Nietzsche had been with him. Her hopes that he would be better by the time she finally caught up with him had faded. Her pleasure over the view dimmed. There was something, though, a look in his eyes that seemed to Nietzsche somehow different. She couldn't put her finger on what it was or what it could mean. He'd always had a penetrating gaze, a cutting, raptor-like appraisal, but now, the way he met her gaze, it was even more acute, as if he were laying her open and searching her soul. Nietzsche had nothing to hide, though, especially from Richard. She had nothing but his best interests at heart. She wanted nothing more than for him to be happy. She would do anything to help him to be happy. She supposed that was why her mood had sunk. Even though he was still determined, she knew that he was growing ever more dispirited. The light of life in his eyes was something Nietzsche treasured. She would not want to see it go out. Trying to keep up with him left Nietzsche no opportunity to ask him about what had gone on with the witch woman. From Kara's silence, Nietzsche knew that whatever had happened, it had not gone as well as Richard had expected. That was no surprise to Nietzsche. How could a witch woman, even if she wanted to help, be of any use in finding a woman who existed only in Richard's mind? Whatever chain fire could be, Nietzsche had no idea, but she could sense in his voice, as well as his tense expression, how eager Richard was to discover its meaning. After having lived with him for so long, Nietzsche knew his feelings without him having to say a word. It was obvious he'd placed a lot of significance on the meaning behind chain fire. More than that, though, Nietzsche was worried as to what could have happened to his sword. She couldn't imagine why he didn't have it with him. Her concern had been heightened all the more by the way Kara had immediately cut off the question to say nothing of the way Richard had not mentioned it. The sword of truth was not something Richard would have lightly forgotten all about. Higher up on the mountain, as they rode up the switchbacks, the road emerged from a thick growth of towering spruce trees before a stone bridge spanning a chasm of immense depth. 
It looked to Nietzsche as if the mountain were split open to its core, with the closer side pulled away from the rest of the mountain. As they rode single file across the bridge spanning the yawning abyss, she glanced over the edge and could see sheer rock walls to each side, dropping down through cottony clouds drifting by below them. It was a dizzying sight that made her stomach feel queasy. Nietzsche could tell by Sardine's gait how tired he was. His ears lazily swiveled toward the drop to each side as they crossed the bridge. Richard and Kara's horses, though, were lathered and blowing hard. Nietzsche knew how well Richard treated animals, and yet he was showing these no mercy. He obviously thought there were higher values involved than the lives of animals. She knew what that value was, human life, one in particular. The walls of the keep, composed of intricately joined blocks of dark granite, rose up like a cliff before them. Coming off the bridge, riding between Richard in front and Kara at the rear, Nietzsche stared up at the keep's complex maze of ramparts, bastions, towers, connecting passageways and bridges. The place looked somehow alive, as if it were watching them approach the gaping entrance of arched stone where the road tunneled under the base of the outer wall. Without hesitation, Richard trotted his horse in under the raised, massive portcullis. Given a choice, Nietzsche would have been a bit more cautious in her approach to such a place. Her skin crawled with the power emanating from within. She had never before felt such a strong sense of the force of magic from within a place. It was like standing alone on a plain as a vast, massive thunderstorm was about to envelop her. The sensation gave her some measure of the shields that guarded the keep. From what she had to conclude by what she could sense, the shields at the Palace of the Prophets had been child's play by comparison. Two, those were predominantly additive, and the palace had been built for an entirely different purpose. Here, subtractive shields were employed in equal service. The lethality of their dominion was not concealed, but manifest to those whose business it was to know of such things. Almost unnoticed, hazy clouds had closed in overhead, leaving the late afternoon sky a flat steel gray. The gloom that replaced the sunlight made the stone of the keep look all the darker, all the more forbidding almost as if the keep itself had drawn a shroud of clouds tightly around itself as it watched the approach of a sorceress and a wizard able to command powers that yet haunted this place. After coming out from under the arched opening in the thick outer wall, they emerged on a road that continued through the deep interior canyon of the keep. Beyond, the road tunneled through another dark wall that provided a second barrier, should one ever be necessary. Without pause, Richard rode on into that long, dark passageway. The sounds of the horse's hooves echoed off the damp stone under the murky, arched passage. Beyond the tunnel, they emerged beside an expansive paddock growing thick with lush grass. The gravel road ran along the side of a wall to the right with several doors. The first doors they'd encountered just inside the portcullis would have been where visitors entered. Nietzsche surmised that this, beyond the second wall, was probably the working entrance to the keep. A fence along the other side of the road enclosed the paddock. Beyond, to the left, the back side of the paddock was walled off by the keep itself. At the far end stood the stables. Without a word, Richard dismounted and opened the gate to the paddock, letting his horse go in but leaving it saddled. Perplexed, Kara and Nietzsche nonetheless followed his example before following him across the grounds toward an entrance with a dozen wide granite steps worn smooth and sway-backed over time. They led up into a recessed entryway where simple but heavy double doors into the keep proper began to creak open. An old man, wavy white hair in disarray, peered out like a homeowner surprised by visitors. He gulped air apparently winded from having run through the keep when he'd realized that someone was coming. He had no doubt been alerted by webs of magic that announced anyone taking the road up to the keep. 
In ancient times, there would have been people closer at hand to see to anyone newly arrived. Now there was only the old man. By the way he was breathing, he must have been clear across the keep when the alarms had warned him. Even through the look of astonishment on his thin, wrinkled face, Nietzsche recognized elements of the features. She knew that he could be none other than Richard's grandfather, Zed. He was tall, but as thin as a sapling. His hazel eyes were wide with wonder and a kind of childlike excitement, if not innocence. His plain, unadorned robes marked him as a great wizard. He wore his age well. It was a pleasing preview of how, in part, time might treat Richard. The old man threw his arms up over his head. Richard! A joyous grin swept across his face. Bags! Is that really you, my boy? Zed emerged from the doorway and started down the worn steps into the dreary light. Richard ran to his grandfather and lifted him off the steps, hugging him fiercely enough to drive the wind from the already winded old man. They both laughed, a pleasing sound with obvious kinship. Zed, you can't imagine how glad I am to see you. And you, my boy, Zed said in a voice turning teary. It's been too long, far too long. He reached a stick-like hand past Richard and gripped Kara's shoulder. How are you, my dear? You appear to be near to spent. Are you all right? I am Maud Sith, she said, looking a bit indignant. Of course I'm all right. Why would you think I look anything but perfectly fine? Zed chuckled as he pushed back from Richard. No reason, I suppose. You both look like you could use some rest and a meal or two is all. But you do look fine and I'm happy to see you again. Kara smiled at that. I've missed you, Zed. Zed waggled a finger. Not very Maud Sith of you to miss an old man. Rika will be astonished to hear such a thing. Rika? Kara asked in surprise. Rika is here? Zed waggled a hand back in the direction of the partly opened door. She's back in there somewhere, patrolling, I imagine. She seems to have two preoccupations in life, patrolling and harassing me. I'm telling you, I have no peace of mind with the woman. Worse, she's too clever for her own good. At least she's a talented cook. Kara's brows lifted. Rika can cook? Zed winced, pulling a breath through his teeth. Don't tell her I said that or I'll never hear the end of it. The woman... Zed, Richard interrupted. I have trouble and I need help. Are you well? You aren't ill, are you? You don't look entirely yourself, my boy. Zed pressed a hand to Richard's forehead. Summer fevers are the worst, you know. Heat on top of heat. Bad combination. Yes. No, I mean, it's not that. I need to talk to you. So talk. It has been a long time. Far too long of a time. What's it been? Two years this past spring, if I'm not mistaken. Zed drew back a bit and squeezed Richard's arms as he looked him up and down. Richard, where's your sword? Look, we'll talk about that later, Richard said, irritably disengaging himself from Zed's grip in order to wave away the question. You said you wanted to talk, so talk and tell me where your sword is. Zed redirected his broad grin at Nietzsche. And who is this lovely sorceress you've brought along? Richard blinked at Zed's smile and then glanced at Nietzsche. Oh, sorry. Zed, this is Nietzsche. Nietzsche, this... Nietzsche! Zed roared as he danced back up two of the steps as if he'd spotted a viper. The sister of the dark who took you away to the old world? That Nietzsche? What are you doing with this vile creature? Why would you dare to bring such a woman? Zed, Richard said, forcefully cutting his grandfather off, Nietzsche is a friend. A friend? Are you out of your mind, Richard? How in the world do you expect... Zed, she's on our side now, he gestured heatedly, much the same as Kara or Rika. Things change. Before, either of them would have... His voice trailed off as his grandfather stared at him. You know what I mean. I trust Kara with my life now. 
and she has proven worthy of my trust. I trust Nietzsche the same. I trust them both with my life. Zed finally gripped Richard's shoulder and gave it an affectionate joggle. I guess I do know what you mean. Since I gave you the sword of truth, you've changed a great many things for the better. Why, I would never in my life have imagined that one day I'd happily be eating meals cooked by a moored Sith. And delicious meals they are, too. He caught himself and pointed at Kara. If you tell her I said that, I'll skin you alive. The woman is already incorrigible. Kara only smiled. Zed redirected his gaze to Nietzsche. He didn't have that raptor-like Rahl quality, but in its own way it was just as disarming and looked to have the potential to be just as disturbing. Welcome, sorceress. If Richard says you are a friend, then you are. Sorry to get so huffy. Nietzsche smiled. Perfectly understandable. I didn't like myself back then either. I was under the influence of dark delusions. I was called death's mistress for good reason. Nietzsche gazed into Richard's gray eyes. Your grandson brought me to see the beauty of life. Zed smiled proudly. Yes, that's it exactly. The beauty of life. Richard pounced on the opening. And life is what this is about. Zed, listen, I need... Yes, yes, Zed said, waving off Richard's impatience. You always need something. Haven't been back long enough to get in the door, and already you want to know something. If I recall correctly, the first word you ever spoke was, why? Come on then, come inside. I want to know why you don't have the sword of truth with you. I know you wouldn't let anything happen to it, but I want to hear the whole story. Don't leave out a thing. Come along then. Motioning them all to follow, Richard's grandfather climbed the stairs toward the doorway. Zed, I need... Yes, yes, my boy, you need something. I heard you the first time. I think it looks like rain. No use getting started when we're about to get wet. Come inside and I will hear what you have to say. Zed's voice began echoing as he disappeared into the darkness. You look like you could use a meal. Is anyone else hungry? Reunions always give me an appetite. Richard's arms dropped his hands flopping against his thighs in frustration. He sighed and then hurried up the steps after his grandfather. Nietzsche knew that had it been anyone else, Richard would have handled it quite differently. People who loved you and had raised you since you were little and had comforted you when you cried at a thunderstorm or the howl of a wolf tended to be disarming to deal with. She could see that it was no different with Richard. His love of his grandfather tied his hands with unbreakable ropes of respect. It was a view of Richard Nietzsche had never seen before, and one she found quite endearing. Here was the Lord Rahl, the leader of the Daharan Empire, the seeker of truth, a man who could make just about anyone tremble with a look brought to flustered silence by a kindly if bewildering lecture. Had the matters involved not been so serious, Nietzsche would have been unable to keep herself from grinning at Richard's utter helplessness before such a frail-looking old man. The sound of water reverberated inside the dark anteroom. Zed cast a hand casually to the side and a lamp on the wall lit. At the ignition of the flame, Nietzsche recognized the reiteration of a spark of power that marked it as a key lamp. With a succession of whooshing sounds, starting on both sides of the entrance, Hundreds of lamps around the vast room lit in pairs. Each whoosh, as a pair of lamps caught flame, was followed almost simultaneously by another, as the lamps around the huge room each took to flame from the engendering magic initiated by the key lamp, the effect being a ring of fire seeming to dance its way around the room. Nietzsche knew that it would have worked the same had someone lit that particular lamp with a flame rather than magic. The light in the room swelled, and in a span of seconds, the anteroom was nearly as bright as day. A clover-leaf-shaped fountain stood centered in the tiled floor. Water spouted high into the air above the top bowl from where it cascaded down each successive tier of ever-wider scalloped bowls 
finally running from points around the bottom bowl in perfectly matched arcs into the surrounding pool contained by an outer wall of variegated white marble made wide enough to act as a bench. All the way around the oval-shaped room, highly polished deep red marble columns stood below arches supporting a continuous balcony. A hundred feet overhead, a section of glassed roof let in some of the somber late-day light to balance the glow of the lamps down in the heart of the room. At night, the glassed roof would probably also let in the soft, cold light of the moon to give the darkened room a spectral feel, but with it being the new moon, to say nothing of the gathering clouds, there would be no moonlight this night. By the look of the sky through the glassed roof section, Nietzsche thought that Zed was right. It did look like it might rain. Belying first impressions of the keep, the room was a beautiful, warm entrance to what seemed such a cold and austere exterior. It hinted at the life the place once held. Like the forsaken city down in the valley, Nietzsche was rather saddened by the emptiness. Welcome to the wizard's keep. Perhaps we all should... Zed, Richard growled, cutting his grandfather short. I need to talk to you right now. It's important. Beloved grandfather or not, Nietzsche could see that Richard was at the end of his patience. Tight white knuckles stood out in stark contrast against his tanned skin and the prominent veins on the backs of his fists. Judging by the way he looked, he hadn't gotten much sleep in recent days or had much to eat. She didn't think that she had ever seen him looking this exhausted or this near his wit's end. Kara as well looked well past the limits of her endurance, although she did a good job of covering it. Mord Sith were trained to ignore physical discomfort. Despite being overjoyed at seeing his grandfather, Richard's preoccupation with finding the woman from his imagination had cut the pleasantries of the reunion short. The mad rush that had become life since that day he had been shot with the arrow and had nearly died seemed to have come down to this moment. Zed blinked in innocent surprise. Well, of course, Richard, of course. He spread his arms as he spoke in a gentle voice. You know that you can always talk to me. Whatever is on your mind, you know that what's chain fire. That was nearly the first thing he had asked of Nietzsche, too. Zed stood unmoving, a blank look on his face. Chain fire, he repeated in a flat tone. Yes, chain fire. A serious expression weighing on his face, Zed considered the question with care, turning toward the fountain as he thought it over. The waiting was almost painful. The fountain burbled and splashed and echoed in the otherwise silent room. Chain fire, Zed drawled to himself as he ran a stick-like finger along his smooth jawbone while staring into the tumbling, dancing water cascading down each successive tier of the fountain. Nietzsche stole a glance at Kara, but the Mord Sith was unreadable. Her drawn face looked as tired and ill-fed as Richard's, but being Kara, she stood tall and straight, not allowing her exhaustion to get the better of her. That's right, chain fire, Richard said impatiently through gritted teeth. Do you know what it means? Zed turned back to his grandson, lifting open his hands. He looked not only puzzled, but apologetic. I'm sorry, Richard, but I've never heard the word chain fire before. The fury leaving him, Richard looked like he might fall down. The disappointment was only too evident in his eyes. His shoulders slumped as he let out a breath. Kara carefully but quietly slipped a step closer, ready to help him if he collapsed. To Nietzsche, that looked like a real possibility. Richard, Zed said, his voice taking on an edge. Where is your sword? Richard erupted. It's just a piece of steel. Just a piece? Richard's face went crimson. It's just a stupid chunk of metal. Don't you think that there might be more important things to worry about? Zed cocked his head. More important things? What are you talking about? I want my life back. Zed stared at him but remained silent, 
and in doing so thereby almost commanded his grandson to say something more to fill in some of the blanks. Richard paced from the fountain to a broad band of triple steps that led up between two of the red marble pillars. A long red and gold carpet bordered with simple black geometric designs ran between the pillars off under a balcony and into the darkness. Richard raked the fingers of both hands back through his hair. What difference does it make? No one believes me. No one will help me find her. Nietzsche felt a deep sense of sorrow for him. At that moment she regretted every harsh thing she had ever said trying to convince him that he had only dreamed up Kalin. He needed to be helped over his delusions, but at that moment she would have been happy to let him hold on to them if it would have brought the light of life back into his eyes. She longed to hold him and tell him that it would be all right, but she couldn't, for more reasons than one. Kara, arms hanging straight at her sides, looked just as saddened to see Richard agonizing so. There seemed no end in sight. Nietzsche suspected that the moored Sith would have agreed with Nietzsche to let Richard have his beautiful dream of the woman he loved, but a lie would not soothe such real pain. Richard, I don't know what you're talking about, but what does it have to do with the Sword of Truth? Zed asked, the edge returning to his voice. Richard closed his eyes a moment against the torment of saying aloud what he had said so many times, so many times when no one ever believed him. I have to find Kalin. Nietzsche could see him draw tighter, bracing for the usual disconcerting questions as to who he was talking about and where he could ever have gotten such a notion. Nietzsche could see that it was almost too much for him to bear another person telling him he was imagining things, questioning his sanity. She could see him dreading it even more coming from his grandfather. Zed tilted his head a little. Kalen? Yes, Richard said with a sigh and without looking up. Kalen, but you wouldn't know who I'm talking about. Ordinarily, Richard would have launched into a ready explanation, but now he looked too dejected to want to bother to explain yet again, to be greeted with incredulity and disbelieving questions. Kalen, Zed's brow drew down in cautious query. Kalen Amnell? Is that the Kalen you're talking about? Nietzsche froze. Richard looked up, his eyes wide. What did you say? he whispered. Kalen Amnell? That Kalen? Nietzsche's heart skipped a beat. Kara's jaw had dropped. In a blink, Richard had the front of Zed's robes in his fists and had lifted the old man clear of the floor. Richard's sweat-slicked muscles glistened in the lamplight. You said her whole name, Kalen Amnell. I didn't tell you her whole name. You said it on your own. Zed was looking more confused by the moment. But that's because the only Kalen I know of is Kalen Amnell. You know Kalen? You know who I'm talking about? The Mother Confessor? Yes, the Mother Confessor. Well, of course. Most people know her, I expect. Richard, what's gotten into you? Let me down. Nietzsche felt dizzy. She couldn't believe her own ears. How was such a thing possible? It wasn't. It was so overwhelmingly, inconceivably impossible that she thought she might faint. His hands trembling, Richard set his grandfather down. What do you mean everyone knows her? Zed pulled on each sleeve in turn, pulling them back down his skinny arms. He rearranged his disheveled robes at his hips, all the time watching his grandson. He looked truly bewildered by Richard's behavior. Richard, what's the matter with you? How could they not know her? She's the mother confessor for crying out loud. Richard swallowed. Where is she? Zed shot a brief, confused glance at Kara and then Nietzsche before looking back at Richard. Why down at the confessor's palace? Richard let out a cry of joy and threw his arms around his grandfather. Chapter 47 Gripping his grandfather's skinny shoulders, Richard shook the old man. 
She's here? Kalin is at the Confessor's Palace? Worry spreading across Zed's wrinkled face, he cautiously nodded. With the back of his hand, Richard wiped away the tears running down his cheek. She's here, he said, turning to Kara. He gripped her shoulders and gave her a firm shake. She's in Aiden Drill. Did you hear? I wasn't imagining it. Zed remembers her. He knows the truth. Kara looked as if she were doing her best to come to grips with her astonishment without letting it be mistaken for unhappiness at the startling news. Lord Rall, I'm happy for you. Really, I am, but I don't see how... Richard, not seeming to notice the Mord Sith's halting uncertainty, turned back to the wizard. What's she doing down there, he asked, his voice bubbling over with excitement. Zed, looking gravely troubled, again glanced to both Kara and Nietzsche before tenderly laying a hand on Richard's shoulder. Richard, that's where she's buried. The world seemed to stop. In a flash of understanding, Nietzsche realized the truth. Suddenly it all became clear. Zed's behavior now made sense. The woman Zed was talking about was not the Kalin, the mother confessor from Richard's imagination, the woman he imagined loved him and had married him. It was the real mother confessor. Nietzsche had warned Richard that in his dream he had done a dangerous thing by imagining a woman as his bride who was not simply some anonymous imaginary woman, but instead was a woman he had heard of before. A woman who, it so happened, was well known in the Midlands. This was the real Kalin Amnell, the real mother confessor, who was buried down at the confessor's palace, not the one Richard had dreamed up to be his love. It had been this very reality that Nietzsche had feared would eventually come to shatter Richard's world. She had warned him that this was bound to happen. She had warned him that he would one day come face to face with the truth, this was the moment. This was the very thing she had been trying to prevent. Still, Nietzsche felt no joy at all in being right. She felt only crushing sadness at what Richard must be feeling. She couldn't even begin to imagine how confusing, how disorienting it had to be for him. For someone as firmly grounded in reality as Richard always had been, this entire ordeal had to be devastating. Richard could only stare. Richard, Zed finally said, giving him a gentle squeeze on his arms. Are you all right? What's going on? Richard slowly blinked. He looked in a state of shock. What do you mean she's buried down at the confessor's palace? He asked in a shaky voice. When did it happen? Zed guardedly licked his lips. I don't know when she died. When I was down there, when Jagang's army was marching on Aden Drill, I saw the grave marker. I didn't know her. I just saw her grave, that's all. It's a pretty big marker. It would be hard to miss. The confessors were all killed by the quads that Darkin Rawl sent. She must have died back then. Richard, you couldn't possibly have known the woman. She had to have been dead and buried before we ever left our home in Westland, back before the boundary came down, back when you were still a woods guide in the Heartland Forest. Richard pressed his palms to his forehead. No, no, you don't understand. You're having the same problem as everyone else. It's not her. You know Kalen. Zed lifted a sympathetic hand toward his grandson. Richard, that's not possible. The quads killed the confessors. Yes, the other confessors were killed by those assassins, but not her, not Kalen. Richard waved a hand as he dismissed the argument. Zed, she's the one who came to ask you to appoint the seeker. That's why we left Westland. You know Kalen. Zed frowned. What in the world are you talking about? We had to leave when Dark and Rawl came hunting us. We had to run for our lives in part, but Kalen came looking for you first. She's the one who told us that Dark and Rahl had put the boxes of Orden in play. He was on the other side of the boundary. If not for Kalen coming, how would we have even known? 
Zed peered at Richard as if he suspected he might be quite ill. Richard, when the boxes of Orden are put into play, the snake vine grows. It even says so in the Book of Counted Shadows. You of all people know that. You were in the upper Venn and were bitten by a snake vine. It caused a fever and you came to me for help. That's how we knew the boxes of Orden were in play. Dark and Raw then came to Westland and attacked us. Well, yes, that's all true in a way. But Kaylin told us what was happening in the Midlands. She confirmed it, Richard growled in frustration. It's more than that, more than her coming to ask you to appoint a seeker. You know her. I'm afraid that I don't, Richard. Dear spirit, Zed, you spent last winter with her and the Daharan army. When Nietzsche took me down to the old world, Kalin was there with Kara and you. He pointed insistently at Kara, as if it would somehow prove the point and end the nightmare. She and Kara fought with you all winter. Zed glanced up at Kara. Kara, behind Richard's back, turned her palms up and shrugged at Zed to let him know that she didn't know any more about it than Zed did. As long as you brought up the business about you being the seeker, where is your... Richard snapped his fingers, his face suddenly lighting up. That's not Kalin's grave. Of course it is. There's no mistaking this grave. It's prominent, and I clearly recall that it has her name carved right in the stone. Yes, it's her name, but not her grave. I realize what you're talking about now. Richard chuckled with relief. I'm telling you, it's not her grave. Zed didn't think it was funny. Richard, I've seen her name on the stone. It's her, the mother confessor, Kaylin Amnell. Richard shook his head insistently. No, that's not her. That was a trick. A trick? Zed cocked his head, frowning. What are you talking about? What sort of trick? They were hunting her. The order was after Kaylin when they occupied Aidendril. They had taken over the council, condemned her to death, and they were hunting her. To keep them from chasing her, you put a death spell on her. What? A death spell? Richard, do you have any idea of the magnitude of what you're suggesting? Of course I do. But it's true. You needed to feign her death so that the order would think they had succeeded and wouldn't come after her so that she could get away. Don't you remember? You made that headstone, or at least you had it made. I came here to find her. It was a few years back. Your spell even fooled me. I thought she was dead, but she wasn't. His confusion had receded, and now Zed was looking seriously worried. Richard, I can't imagine what is wrong with you, but this is simply... You two escaped to safety but you left me a message on her headstone, Richard said, jabbing a finger at Zed's chest, so that I would know that she was really still alive, so that I wouldn't despair, so that I wouldn't give up. I almost did, but then I figured it out. Zed was nearly boiling over with frustration, impatience, and concern. Nietzsche knew the feeling. Bags, my boy, what message are you talking about? The words on the headstone. The inscription. It was a message to me. Zed planted his fists on his hips. What are you talking about? What message? What was this message? Richard started pacing, pressing his fingertips to his temples as he mumbled to himself, apparently trying to recall the exact wording. Or, Nietzsche thought, trying to dream it up the way he always dreamed up answers to talk his way out of facing the truth. She knew that this time he was making a mistake that would catch him up. Reality was closing in around him, even if he didn't yet recognize it. He soon would. Nietzsche dreaded that unequivocal juncture of delusion and truth. Despite wanting Richard to get better, to get over the false memories he had been suffering, she dreaded the pain she knew it would bring him when he eventually came face to face with the unambiguous truth. Even more, she dreaded what would happen to him if he couldn't see the truth, or refuse to see it, if he sank forever deeper into a world of illusion. Not here, he muttered. Something about not being here. 
and something about my heart. Zed pushed his cheek out with his tongue, apparently in an effort to keep still while he watched his grandson pacing back and forth, and at the same time probably tried to imagine what could be happening to him. No, Richard said abruptly as he halted. No, not my heart. That's not what it said. It's a big monument. I remember now. It said, Kaylin Amnell, Mother Confessor. She is not here, but in the hearts of those who love her. It was a message for me not to give up hope because she wasn't really dead. She wasn't really there in that grave. Richard, Zed said in soft consolation, it's a common enough thing to say on a grave marker that someone isn't dead but rather lives on in the hearts of those who love her. Grave diggers probably have stacks of grave markers made up with that sentiment, carved with those very words. But she wasn't buried there. She wasn't. It says that she is not here for a reason. Then who is buried in her grave? Zed asked. Richard went still for a moment. No one, he finally said, his gaze wandering off as he thought. Mistress Sanderholt, the cook at the palace, she was fooled by your death spell like everyone else. When I finally got here, she told me that you stood there on the platform while Kaylin was beheaded. She was in mourning over it and terribly upset. But I realized that you wouldn't do such a thing, and so it had to be one of your tricks. You told me that, remember? Sometimes the best magic is just a trick. Zed nodded. That part is true enough. Mistress Sanderholt told me that Kalin's body had been burned in a funeral pyre, the whole thing supervised by the first wizard himself. She said that Kalin's ashes were then buried before that immense stone marker. Mistress Sanderholt even took me out to the secluded courtyard beside the palace where confessors are buried. She showed me the grave. I was horrified. I thought it was her, that she was dead, until I figured out the message carved in the stone the message the two of you left for me to find. Richard gripped his grandfather's shoulders again. Do you see? It was just a trick to throw our enemies off her trail. She wasn't really dead. She wasn't really buried there. Nothing is buried there except maybe some ashes. Nietzsche thought that it was rather convenient that Richard imagined her being cremated in his story of the death spell bluff so that all that remained were ashes that couldn't be identified. He always came up with something that, to his mind, logically explained the lack of evidence. Nietzsche didn't know if confessors really were cremated, but if they were, that would only provide him with another useful pretext to prop up his story so that he could continue to deny that it was her. They would again have no way to prove otherwise. Unless, of course, he was dreaming up the funeral pyre part of his story, and confessors weren't ordinarily cremated. And so you say that you went there, Zed asked. Down to where the gravestone stands? Yes, and then Denna came. Denna was dead, Kara said, interrupting for the first time. You killed her in order to escape from her at the People's Palace. She couldn't have been there unless, of course, she appeared as a spirit. Yes, that's right, Richard said, turning to Kara. She did. She came as a spirit and took me to a place between worlds so that I could be with Kaelin there. Kara's eyes briefly turned to the wizard. Her incredulity was impossible for her to mask, so she looked away from Richard and occupied herself with scratching the back of her neck. Nietzsche wanted to scream, his story grew more insanely convoluted by the moment. She remembered the prelate once teaching Nietzsche as a novice how the seed of lies once planted only grew more tangled and out of control over time. Zed came up from behind and gently grasped Richard's shoulders. Come on, my boy, I think you need to get some rest. And then afterwards we can... No, Richard cried out as he twisted away. I'm not imagining it. I'm not making it up. Nietzsche knew he was doing just that. In a certain sense, it was remarkable the way he was able, on the spot, to weave new events based on his original delusion to continually manage to escape the trap of the truth. But he could not escape it forever. 
there was the matter of the true mother confessor buried in the grave, and that was all too real. Unless it turned out that the Midlands actually did cremate their confessors, in which case Richard would be able to continue to hobble along, clinging to his dream for a little while longer, until the next problem cropped up. Sooner or later, though, something was going to shatter those dreams. Zed tried again. Richard, you're tired. You look like you've been living on a horse for... I can prove it, Richard said in calm defiance. Everyone went quiet. You don't believe me, I know. None of you do. But I can prove it. What do you mean? Zed asked. Come on. Come with me down to the gravestone. Richard, I told you the gravestone very well could say what you said you remember, but that proves nothing. It's a common enough sentiment to express on a gravestone. Do they typically burn the bodies of the mother confessor on a funeral pyre? Or was that just part of your trick, so that you wouldn't have to produce her body at the funeral when she was supposedly buried? Zed was beginning to look more than just a little indignant. When I used to live here, the bodies of confessors were never desecrated. The mother confessor was placed in a silver-clad coffin in her white dress, and the people were allowed to view her one last time to say their farewells before she was buried. Richard glared at his grandfather, at Kara, and finally at Nietzsche. If I have to dig up the grave and prove to all of you that there is nothing buried under the gravestone, then that's what I will do. We need to get this settled so that we can move on to the solution to what's happening. In order to do that, I need you all to believe me. Zed spread his hands. Richard, that isn't necessary. Yes, it is. It is necessary. I want my life back. No one offered an argument. Zed, have I ever told you a malicious lie? No, my boy, you never have. I'm not lying now. Richard, Nietzsche said, no one is saying that you're lying, only that you're suffering the unfortunate effects of delirium induced by an injury. It's not your fault. We all know you aren't doing this deliberately. He turned to his grandfather. Zed, don't you see? Think about it. Something is going wrong in the world. Something is terribly wrong. For some reason that I haven't been able to figure out, I'm the only one who is aware of it. I'm the only one who remembers Kalin. There has to be something behind this, something wicked. Maybe Jagang is responsible. Jagang had the beast created to come after you, Nietzsche said. He put everything into that effort. He wouldn't need to do anything else. Besides, with the beast already stalking you, what purpose would it serve? I don't know. I don't have all the answers, but I know the truth of part of it. And how can it be that you alone know the truth and everyone else is wrong? That everyone's memory but yours has failed them, Zed asked. I don't know the answer to that either, but I can prove what I'm telling you. I can show you the grave. Come on. I told you, Richard, the marker says common words. Richard's expression turned dangerous. Then we will dig up the grave so that you can all see that it's empty and that I'm not crazy. Zed lifted a hand toward the still open door. But it will be dark soon. What's more, it's going to rain. Richard turned back from the doorway. We have an extra horse. We can still make it down there while we have daylight. If we need to, we can use lanterns. If I must, I will dig in the dark. This is more important than worrying about a little rain or the lack of light. I need to get this over now so that we can get on to solving the very real problem and so that I can find Kalen before it's too late. Let's go. Zed gestured heatedly. Richard, this is... Let him do as he asks, Nietzsche said, interrupting, drawing all eyes. We've all heard enough. This is important to him. We must allow him to do as he thinks he must. It's the only chance we have to finally settle the matter. Before Zed could answer her, a moored Sith appeared from between two red pillars at the opposite side of the room. Her blonde hair was pulled back into a single braid like Kara's. She wasn't quite as tall as Kara and not as lean, 
but she looked just as formidable in the way she carried herself as if she feared nothing and lived for an excuse to prove it. What's going on? I heard... She stared in sudden astonishment. Kara, is that you? Rika, Kara said with a smile and a nod. It's good to see your face again. Rika bowed her head to Kara more deeply than Kara had before staring at Richard. She stepped forward into the room. Her eyes widened. Lord Ral, I haven't seen you since... Richard nodded. Since the People's Palace in Dahara. When I came to close the gateway to the underworld, you were one of the moored Sith who helped get me up to the Garden of Life. You were the one who held my shirt at my left shoulder as all of you guided me safely through the palace. One of your sister moored Sith gave her life that night that I might complete my mission. Rika smiled in astonishment. You remember? We were all in our red leather. I can't believe you have that good a memory that you could remember me much less that I was the one at your left shoulder. She bowed her head. And you honor us all to remember one who fell in battle. I do have a good memory. Richard cast a dark glare at Nietzsche and then Zed. That was just before I came back to Aidendrill and the gravestone with Kalin's name on it. He turned back to Rika. Watch over the keep, will you, Rika? We all have to go down to the city for a while. Of course, Lord Ral, Rika said, bowing her head again, looking almost giddy to be in Richard's presence and to be remembered. Richard again swept his raptor glare across the rest of them. Let's go. Richard vanished out the doorway. Zed caught Nietzsche's sleeve on her way by. He was hurt, wasn't he? When she hesitated, he went on. You said he was suffering delusions from being injured. Nietzsche nodded. He was shot with an arrow. He almost died. Nietzsche healed him. Kara leaned in as she spoke in a low voice. She saved Lord Rao's life. Zed lifted an eyebrow. A friend indeed. I healed him, Nietzsche confirmed. But it was difficult beyond anything I've ever attempted before. I may have saved his life, but I now worry that I didn't do a good enough job of it. What do you mean? Zed asked. I fear that I may have somehow done something to cause his delusions. That isn't true, Kara said. I wonder if it is, Nietzsche said. If I might have done more, or done things differently. She swallowed past the lump growing in her throat. She feared that it was true, that Richard's problem was her fault, that she hadn't acted quickly enough, or that she might have done something dreadfully wrong. She constantly fretted over her decision that terrible morning to get Richard to a safe place before working on him. She had feared an attack that would have fatally interrupted her efforts to heal him. But maybe if she would have simply started right then and there on the battlefield, he might not now be chasing phantoms. After all, an attack never had come so she'd made the wrong judgment about needing to get him to the deserted farmhouse. She didn't know at the time that no attack was imminent, but maybe if she would have taken the time to have Victor's men scout the area, she could have started healing Richard much sooner. She hadn't done that because she feared that if they scouted, and she was right about more of the enemy being nearby, then they would have had to move Richard anyway, and by then his time would have run out. Even so, she was the one who had made the decisions, and Richard was the one now suffering delusions. Something had gone wrong that terrible night. There was no one in the world who mattered to her more than Richard. She feared that she was the one who had caused him the harm that was ruining his life. What exactly was wrong with him? Zed asked. Where was he shot with the arrow? In the left side of his chest with a barbed bolt from a crossbow. That barbed head lodged in his chest without penetrating all the way through his back. He was able to partially deflect it, so it just missed his heart, but his lung and chest were rapidly filling with blood. Zed lifted an eyebrow in astonishment. And you were able to get the arrow out and heal him? That's right, Kara confirmed with forceful passion. She saved Lord Ra's life. I don't know. 
Nietzsche had difficulty putting it all into words. I've been separated from him as I made my way here. Now that I see him again, see how he has latched so strongly onto his delusion and can't come to see the truth, I'm not so sure I did him any good. How can he live if he can't see the truth of the world around him? While his body may be healed, he's suffering a dreadful kind of slow death as his mind fails him. Zed gave her shoulder a fatherly pat. Nietzsche recognized the light of life in his eyes. It was the same spark that Richard had, at least the same spark he used to have. We'll just have to help him see the truth. And if it destroys his heart? she asked. Zed smiled. It reminded her of Richard's smile, the smile she missed so much. Then we'll just have to heal his heart, now won't we? Nietzsche was unable to bring forth more than a whisper that bordered on tears. And how are we to do that? Zed smiled again and gave her shoulder a firm squeeze. We'll have to see. First, we have to let him see the truth. Then we can worry about healing the wound it will bring his heart. Nietzsche could only nod. She dreaded seeing Richard hurt. And what is this beast you mentioned, the one Jagang created? A weapon created with the use of Sisters of the Dark, Nietzsche said. Something from the time of the Great War. Zed cursed under his breath at the news. Kara looked like she had something to say about the beast, but she thought better of it and instead started for the door. Come on, I don't want Lord Rall to get too far ahead of us. Zed grumbled his agreement. Looks like we're going to get wet. At least if it rains, the Mord Sith said, it will wash some of the horse off of me. Chapter 48 The drizzle started before they were out of the paddock. Richard was already gone. There was no telling how far ahead of them he had gotten. Kara wanted to hurry and catch up with him, but Zed told her that they knew where he was going and there was no point in risking breaking the leg of one of the tired horses because if that happened, then they would only end up having to walk down the mountain after Richard. And then, after visiting the graveyard of the confessors, walk all the way back up. Besides, Zed told her, you'll never be able to catch him. Well, you might be right about that, Kara said as she spurred her horse into a canter. But I don't want him alone any longer than necessary. I'm his protection. Especially since he's without his sword, Zed muttered sourly. They had little choice but to hurry after Kara. By the time they'd raced down the mountain and reached the city, the daylight was fading and the drizzle strengthening. Nietzsche knew they were going to be soaked before it was over, but there was no helping it. Fortunately, it was warm enough that at least they wouldn't be freezing in the wet weather. Knowing where Richard would be, they made their way to the grounds of the confessor's palace, where they quickly found his horse tied to one of the rings holding chains strung between decorative granite stanchions. Since there was no opening in the chains, they were apparently meant to indicate a private area of the grounds. After the three of them tied their horses alongside Richard's, Kara and Nietzsche followed Zed as he stepped over the chain. This was clearly not a place where outsiders were welcome. The secluded courtyard was screened from public view by a row of tall elms and a dense wall of evergreen junipers. Through the thick branches of the grand trees, Nietzsche saw glimpses of the white walls of the confessor's palace looming close by, enfolding and sheltering the wooded graveyard. Because of the way it was hidden away, Nietzsche had expected it to be small, but the place where confessors were buried was actually quite extensive. Trees were placed so as to cut the openness and give each section of the graveyard an intimate feel. By the manner in which it was laid out, with a path and a small vine-covered colonnade ushering people approaching from the palace, it was apparently intended to be accessed solely from the palace through elegant double-glassed doors. In the muted gray light, the quiet place beneath the canopy of trees had a hallowed feel to it. They found Richard up a slight rise in what would be the shady courtyard, were it sunny, 
standing in the drizzle before a polished stone monument, running his fingers through the letters carved in the granite, through the letters of the name Kaelin. Somewhere on the grounds to the confessor's palace, Richard had managed to find shovels and picks. They lay at the ready nearby. Scanning the area, Nietzsche saw that there were storage buildings for groundskeepers set back among hedges, partly hidden around a corner of the palace, and reasoned that Richard had found them there. As she quietly approached him, Nietzsche knew that Richard was on the brink of something potentially very dangerous to him. She stood behind him, hands folded, waiting, as he tenderly touched Kalin's name in stone. Richard, Nietzsche finally said in a soft voice, feeling the need for a reverent tone in such a place. I hope that you will think about everything I've told you, and if things don't turn out the way at this moment you believe they will, know that we will all help you in any way we can. He turned away from her name in stone. Don't be worried about me, Nietzsche. There is nothing under this ground. She isn't here. I'm going to show that to all of you, and then you will have to believe me. I'm going to get my life back. When I do, then you're all going to understand that something is very wrong. Then we're going to have to work to find out what's going on, and we're going to find Kaylin. After holding her gaze for a moment, waiting to see if she would dare to challenge him, Richard, without another word, snatched up a shovel, and with a forceful push of his foot, sank the blade into the slightly mounded grassy ground in front of the stone marker to the dead mother confessor. Zed stood nearby, silent, unmoving, as he watched. He'd brought two lanterns with him. They sat on a stone bench nearby, giving off a weak but steady glow in the still dampness. The drizzle was giving rise to ground fog, although the sky was completely covered over with iron-gray clouds, by the failing light, Nietzsche thought that it must be just after sunset. With it being the darkest night of the new moon, and with thick clouds to hide even the stars, it was going to be a blackest of nights. Even without the drizzle and approaching darkness, it was a miserable time to be digging up dead people. As Richard worked with a kind of controlled but focused anger, Kara finally picked up another shovel. The sooner we get this over with, the better. She plunged her shovel into the damp ground and started helping Richard dig. Zed stood nearby, silent and grim as he watched. Nietzsche would have helped get it over with, but she doubted that more than two people would have room to dig without getting in the way of each other. She might have used magic to accomplish the deed of opening the ground, but she had a strong sense that Zed would not have approved, that he wanted this to be Richard's effort, his muscle, his sweat, his doing. As the light gradually dimmed, Richard and Kara worked themselves ever deeper into the ground. They had to resort to the pick to get through thick roots crisscrossing the gravesite. Such good-sized roots told Nietzsche that the grave had to be older than Richard believed. If he realized as much, he didn't mention it as he worked. Nietzsche supposed that he could somehow be right that this was no real grave, which would explain why the roots had grown as thick as they were. If Richard was right, only a small hole would have had to have been dug among them, just big enough for a ceremonial vessel containing ashes to have been buried. But she didn't for a moment believe it. Shovelful by shovelful, the pile of black dirt to the side of the hole grew ever larger. Although Zed said nothing as he watched, Nietzsche could read in the deep lines of his face that moment by moment he was becoming ever more incensed at exhuming the mother confessor, even if it would settle the matter. He looked like he had a thousand things to say, all bottled up inside him. Nietzsche thought that he would wait until after Richard found the buried truth, but by the grim set of the wizard's jaw, she didn't think that when he finally had his say that it was going to be at all pleasant or understanding. This was behavior that crossed a line with him. When Richard's and Kara's heads, dripping sweat and rainwater, were even with the surface of the ground, Richard's shovel abruptly thunked against something that sounded solid. He and Kara paused. 
Richard looked stunned and confused. According to his story, there ought not to be anything in the grave, except maybe a small container holding ashes, and it was hard to believe that such a container would be buried this deep. It has to be a container for the ashes, he finally said as he looked up at Zed. That has to be it. You wouldn't have simply dumped ashes in the hole in ground. At the funeral, they would have used a receptacle of some kind for the ashes you tricked them into thinking were Kalins. Zed said nothing. Kara watched Richard for a moment and then plunged her shovel in the ground. It also made a resounding thunk. With the back of her wrist, she swiped a strand of blonde hair off her face as she looked up at Nietzsche. Well, it would appear that you found something, Zed's ominous voice seemed to carry through the low fog that had gathered along the ground in the private graveyard. I guess we ought to see what it is. Richard stared up at his grandfather a moment and then went back to digging. It wasn't long before he and Kara had exposed a flat surface. It was too dark to see it clearly, but Nietzsche knew what it was. It was the truth about to be uncovered. It was the end of Richard's delusion. I don't understand, Richard murmured, confused by the size of what they were uncovering. Dig the top clear, Zed ordered with barely restrained displeasure. Richard and Kara worked to carefully but quickly clean the wet dirt away from what was becoming all too clear was a coffin. When they had it fully exposed, Zed ordered them out of the hole they'd dug. The old wizard held his hands over the open grave and turned his palms up. As Richard, Kara, and Nietzsche watched, the heavy coffin began to rise. Dirt fell away as the long object rose up out of the dark void. Stepping back away from the open breach in the sacred ground, Zed gently used his gift to set the coffin on the grass beside the open grave. The exterior was elaborately carved with designs of enfolding fern fronds overlaid with silver. It was reverently, sorrowfully beautiful. Richard could only stare in terror at what the coffin might contain. Open it, Zed commanded. Richard looked up at him for a moment. Open it, Zed repeated. Richard finally knelt close to the silver-clad coffin and used the tip of his shovel to carefully pry the top loose. Kara retrieved the two lanterns, handing one to Zed. She held the other lantern up over Richard's shoulder to help him see. When it finally came loose, Richard lifted the heavy lid enough to slide the top portion aside. The glow from Kara's lamp fell across a decomposed corpse, now almost entirely skeletal. The careful workmanship of the coffin appeared to have so far kept the body dry on its long journey toward dust. The bones were mottled with stains from long burial and the inescapable process of deterioration. A fall of long hair, most still attached to the skull, draped over the shoulders. Little tissue was left, mostly connective tissue, especially that holding the bones of the fingers together. Even this long after death, those fingers still clutched a long-ago crumbled bouquet of flowers. The body of the mother confessor was wearing an exquisite, simply styled, satiny white dress cut square at the neckline that now revealed bare ribs. The bouquet clutched in her hands had been enfolded in a wrapping of pearled lace with a broad golden ribbon attached to it. On the gold ribbon, in stitched letters of silver thread, it said, Beloved Mother Confessor, Kalen Amnell, she will always be in our hearts. There could hardly be any doubt anymore as to the true fate of the Mother Confessor, or to the reality that what Richard had so strongly believed was his memories was nothing more than sweet delusions now turned to dust. Richard his chest heaving, his breath catching, could only stare into the open coffin at the skeletal remains, at the white dress, at the golden ribbon around the black fragments of what had once been a beautiful bouquet of flowers. Nietzsche felt sick. 
Are you satisfied now? Zed asked in a measured tone of smoldering anger. I don't understand, Richard whispered, unable to take his eyes from the ghastly sight. You don't? I think it seems pretty clear, Zed told him. But I know she isn't buried here. I can't explain this. I don't understand the contradiction to what I know is true. Zed clasped his hand. There is no contradiction to understand. Contradictions don't exist. Yes, but I know. Wizard's ninth rule. A contradiction cannot exist in reality, not in part nor in whole. To believe in a contradiction is to abdicate your belief in the existence of the world around you and the nature of the things in it. To instead embrace any random impulse that strikes your fancy. To imagine something is real simply because you wish it were. A thing is what it is. It is itself. There can be no contradictions. But Zed, I have to believe Ah, you believe. You mean that the reality of this coffin and the mother confessor's long buried body has shown you something you did not expect and don't want to accept, and so you wish to instead take refuge in the blind fog of faith? Is that what you mean to say? Well, in this case... Faith is a device of self-delusion, a sleight of hand done with words and emotions founded on any irrational notion that can be dreamed up. Faith is the attempt to coerce truth to surrender to whim. In simple terms, it is trying to breathe life into a lie by trying to outshine reality with the beauty of wishes. Faith is the refuge of fools, the ignorant and the deluded, not of thinking rational men. In reality, contradictions cannot exist. To believe in them, you must abandon the most important thing you possess, your rational mind. The wager for such a bargain is your life. In such an exchange, you always lose what you have at stake. Richard ran his fingers back into his wet hair. But Zed, something is wrong here. I don't know what, but I know it is. You have to help me. I just did. I've allowed you to show us the proof that you yourself named. Here it is, in this coffin. I admit that it isn't as desirable as what you wish were true, but the reality of it can't be evaded. This is what you seek. This is Kalen Abnell, the mother confessor, just as it says on the gravestone. Zed arched an eyebrow as he leaned a little toward his grandson. Unless you can show that this is some kind of trickery, that someone for some reason buried this here as part of an elaborate hoax just to make it look like you're wrong and everyone else is right, that would seem a pretty thin contention if you ask me. I am afraid that from the clear evidence right here, this is the reality, the proof you sought, and there is no contradiction. Richard stared down at the long dead body before him. Something is wrong. This can't be true. It just can't be. The muscles in Zed's jaw flexed. Richard, I have allowed you this gruesome indulgence when by all rights I shouldn't have. Now tell me why you don't have the sword. Where is the sword of truth? Rain patted softly on the canopy of leaves above as Richard's grandfather waited. Richard stared into the coffin. I gave the sword to Shota in exchange for information I needed. Zed's eyes went wide. You did what? I had to, Richard said without looking up at his grandfather. You had to? You had to? Yes. Richard answered in a meek voice. In exchange for what information? Richard put his elbows on the edge of the coffin as his face sank into his hands. In exchange for what might help me find the truth of what's going on. I need answers. I need to know how to find Kalen. In fury, Zed thrust his finger toward the coffin. There is Kalen Amnell right where the gravestone has always said she is buried. 
And what oh-so-valuable bit of information did Shota give you after she tricked you out of the sword? Richard made no effort to contend the characterization of being tricked out of the sword. Chain fire, he said. She told me the word chain fire, but she didn't know what it meant. She told me that I must find the place of the bones in the deep nothing. The deep nothing, Zed mocked. He gazed up at the black sky as he took a breath. I don't suppose Shota was able to tell you what this deep nothing is? Richard shook his head, but didn't look up. She also said to beware the viper with four heads. Zed let out another angry breath. Don't tell me, neither she nor you have any idea what that means either. Again, Richard shook his head without looking up at his grandfather. Is that it? That's the great prize of valuable information you got in exchange for the sword of truth? Richard hesitated. There was one other thing. He spoke so softly that he could hardly be heard over the gentle whisper of rain. Shota said that what I seek is long buried. Zed's smoldering rage threatened to explode. There, he said, thrusting out a finger to point. There is what you seek. Kaelin Amnell, the mother confessor, long buried. Richard, head down, said nothing. For this you traded the sword of truth, a weapon of incalculable value, a weapon that can bring down not only the wicked but the good as well, a weapon handed down from the wizards of the ancient times, meant to be entrusted to only a select few, a weapon I entrusted to you, and you gave it to a witch woman. Do you have any idea at all what I had to go through to recover the Sword of Truth from Shota the last time she got her hands on it? Richard shook his head as he stared at the ground beside the coffin, looking like he dared not test his voice. Nietzsche knew that Richard had a number of things to say in his own defense, had a number of things having to do with his reasoning behind his beliefs and actions, but he said none of them even when offered the chance. As his grandfather raged at him, he knelt in silence, hanging his head beside the open coffin holding the end of his fantasy. I trusted you with something of great value. I thought such a dangerous object was safe in your hands. Richard, you've let me down. You have let everyone down so that you could chase a dream. Well, here it is, bones long buried. I hope you think the trade fair, but I certainly don't. Kara stood nearby, holding the lantern, her hair plastered to her head by the slow but steady rain. She looked like she wanted to defend Richard, but couldn't think of anything to say. Nietzsche likewise feared to say anything. She knew that at that moment, anything they said would only make matters worse. Only the soft hiss of the rain against the leaves filled the otherwise silent, foggy night. Zed, Richard said haltingly, I'm sorry. Sorry won't get it back from Shota's clutches. Sorry won't save those people who Samuel will have beneath that sword. I love you like a son, Richard, and I always will. But I've never before been this disappointed in you. I would never have believed that you would do anything this unthinking and reckless. Richard nodded, unwilling to justify his actions. Nietzsche's heart was breaking for him. I will leave you to bury the Mother Confessor while I go try to think of a way to get the sword away from a witch woman who was a lot smarter than my grandson. You should realize that you may very well be responsible for what comes of this. Richard nodded. Good. I'm glad you can at least understand that much of it. He turned to Kara and Nietzsche, the look in his eyes every bit as intimidating as the look of a Rahl. I want you two to come back to the keep with me. I want to know all about this beast business, everything about it. I must stay and watch over Lord Rahl, Kara said. No, Zed told her. You will come with me and tell me in detail everything that happened with the witch woman. I want to know every word out of Shota's mouth. Kara looked torn. Zid, I can't. Go with him, Kara, 
Richard told her in quiet command. Do as he asks, please. Nietzsche recognized how helpless Richard felt at defending his actions in the presence of his grandfather, regardless of how certain he might have been that he did what he thought was necessary. She understood because she had always been just as helpless in the presence of her mother when her mother told her, as she often did, that she had acted wrongly. Nietzsche had never been able to defend herself against what her mother thought she should have done. Her mother was always able to effortlessly make Nietzsche's choices seem petty and selfish. No matter how old she was, she was still a child before those who raised her. Even when she had been at the Palace of the Prophets for years, her mother could still make her feel ten years old and foolish. Because Richard loved and respected his grandfather, that actually made it all that much more difficult for him than it had been for Nietzsche. Despite everything Richard had accomplished, his strength, his knowledge, his ability, his mastery, he could not argue or reason his way out of the reality of having disappointed his grandfather. And, because he loved and respected him, it hurt all the more. Go on, Nietzsche told Kara as she gently put her hand on the small of the woman's back. Do as he says for now. I think Richard could use some time alone to think this through and get his bearings. Page 493. Kara, her gaze going back and forth between Nietzsche and Richard, looked like she thought this was something Nietzsche might be better able to handle, and so nodded her agreement. You too, Zed told Nietzsche. The mother confessor needs to be laid to rest. Let Richard see to it. I need to know your part in this, every bit of it, so that I can try to figure out how to reverse all the trouble born not just of this, but of what your gang has done. All right, Nietzsche said. Get the horses and I'll be right there. Zed cast a brief last look at Richard still huddled on his knees beside the coffin before agreeing with a nod to Nietzsche. After he'd vanished with Kara through the junipers and into the fog, Nietzsche crouched down beside Richard and laid a hand on his back between his slumped shoulders. It will be all right, Richard. I wonder if anything will ever be all right again. It may not seem that way right now, but it will. Zed will get over his anger of the moment and come to understand that you were doing your best to act responsibly. I know that he loves you and that he didn't intend what he said to hurt you so. Richard nodded without looking up as he knelt in the mud beside the open coffin holding the corpse of the long-dead Kalen Amnell, the woman he had imagined had been his love. Nietzsche, he finally asked so softly she could hardly hear him over the soft sound of the gentle rain. Will you do something for me? Anything, Richard. One last time. Be death's mistress for me. She rubbed his back and then stood, tears mixing with the rain on her face. By sheer force of will, past the sob struggling to escape, she made her voice steady. I can't, Richard. You've taught me to embrace life. Chapter 49 The heavy paneled door opened part way. Rika stuck her head into the silent room. Someone is coming. Nietzsche pushed her padded chair away from the polished library table. Coming? Up toward the keep. Do you know who? She asked as she stood. Rika shook her head. Zed just told me that the shields warned him that someone was on their way up the road. He thought you ought to know. I tell you, all the magic flying around in this place makes my skin crawl. I'll go find Richard. Rika nodded before vanishing out of the doorway. Nietzsche quickly returned the book she had been studying to its slot in the vast expanse of mahogany shelves that filled the quiet library. The book was a tedious report on activities in the keep during the Great War. Nietzsche found it rather strange, reading about all the people who had once lived in the wizard's keep thousands of years ago. It seemed a disconnected history, except when she intermittently reminded herself that they were talking about the very place where she was. 
She considered how, in contrast, the palace of the prophets had been so full of life and activity for so long. Nietzsche couldn't imagine the palace of the prophets empty of all but a few souls, and the keep was vastly larger. Of course, now the palace was no more, while the keep still stood. Nietzsche hadn't really been interested in the book she'd been reading. It was boring, but she didn't really care. It was merely something to occupy her time. She couldn't force herself to concentrate on anything that would be absorbing or that would require her to put any great effort into thinking. She was too distracted. The new moon, at the time they had dug up the grave of the mother confessor, had grown to a full moon and was now approaching its last quarter again, and yet nothing much had changed. A few days after digging up the body, Zed had told Richard that he loved him and was sorry to have been so hard on him when maybe he should have found out a little more before saying the things he'd said. Zed promised that they would figure out a way to get Richard's sword back, and everything would be all right. It might have been sincere, and it might have been true, but for Richard the hurt of such a personal failure was hard to put back into the bottle. He had not just disappointed and angered his grandfather, he had failed to prove his dream was in fact the truth. He had put everything he had into the effort. He had been certain, and in the end he had only proved himself wrong. Richard had only nodded to Zed's words. Nietzsche didn't think it mattered much to him either way if Zed had softened his viewpoint. He had reached the end of his ideas, his hopes, and his efforts. Nothing had helped him. After that night, the life had gone out of him. Zed had interrogated Kara and Nietzsche for hours that first night. Nietzsche had been stunned to hear from Kara what Shota had said about the beast becoming a blood beast because Nietzsche had inadvertently given it the measure of Richard's ancestral blood. She was horrified to learn that she had been responsible for intensifying the danger to Richard. While astonished at how Nietzsche had accomplished saving Richard's life, Zed had quietly assured her that had she not acted, Richard would most certainly have died right then and there. He said that she had given Richard a chance at life, and now they could work to solve the problem of the beast Jagang's sisters had created, as well as Richard's strange delusions and the matter of recovering his sword. From what Shota had revealed about the beast, on top of what Nietzsche already knew, it didn't look to Nietzsche that they had much of a chance of success. She had no idea at all of how to even begin to destroy such a beast spawned of dark powers. She had also been embarrassed to hear Kara telling about how Shota had revealed to Richard Kara's plan for Nietzsche to interest Richard romantically. Zed, thankfully, had withheld any comments on that part of Kara's story. That, among other things, had left Nietzsche feeling rather hopeless and helpless. The Imperial Order was rampaging unchecked through the New World. The Beast was stalking Richard, and he was not himself, to say the least. In some ways, it reminded her of her dead attitude toward life back before Richard. She had been taught that she had been born lucky in every way, and because she had ability, it was her duty to devote herself to those in need. No matter how hard she worked, the needs always outpaced her ability to meet them, leaving her perpetually in debt to the ever-worsening lives of others while her own life was not her own. Her feeling about what was happening now with the Beast and Richard's delusions were different in almost every way, except they were the same in that they gave her that familiar feeling of hollow hopelessness. Richard had spent the long days since opening the grave and discovering the truth off by himself, with the exception that Kara, after answering all of Zed's tedious questions about everything she knew about what had happened with Shota, refused to leave Richard's side for any reason. Since Richard was in no mood to talk to anyone, Kara had become his silent shadow. It was strange seeing the two of them together, totally at ease with each other even at such a time. It didn't seem to Nietzsche like the two of them even needed to speak, yet they managed, with a look, a slight shrug, or a nothing at all, to all the time understand each other. Nietzsche felt like an unwelcome outsider to his misery, and so she let him be. She remained as close as she could, so that she would be at hand should the beast attack, 
but she stayed out of his sight and left him to his solitude. The first four or five days after arriving at the keep, Richard had spent in the confessor's palace, wandering the magnificent rooms and vast network of halls. Nietzsche stayed in a guest room in the palace out of sight while Richard roamed aimlessly about the empty place. After that, he'd gone out and wandered the city of Adendrill for a half dozen days, walking the streets and alleys as if reliving the life that had once been there. It was a lot more difficult for Nietzsche to stay close to him when he walked all day long through the city. After that, he had spent yet more days wandering the forests of the mountains around Adendrill, sometimes not even returning at night. Richard was at home in the woods, so Nietzsche had decided not to follow him, knowing how difficult it would have been for her to keep Richard from knowing she was there. She was comforted somewhat by her connection of magic with him that allowed her always to be aware of what direction he was and roughly how far away. When he didn't come back at night, though, Nietzsche paced, unable to sleep. Zed finally asked Richard to please remain at the keep so that in case the beast were to attack, Zed and Nietzsche could help stop it. Richard had done as he'd been asked without comment or objection. He'd spent recent days, instead of wandering the palace or the city or the woods, wandering the outer ramparts of the keep, staring off into the distance. Nietzsche desperately wanted to do something to help him, but Zed had insisted that there was nothing to do but wait and see if time would begin to bring him around to the reality that he had only dreamed up his relationship with Kalin during the time he had been unconscious. In this, Nietzsche didn't really think time would solve anything. She'd been with Richard long enough to realize that this was something bigger. She believed that he needed some kind of help, but she didn't know what that help could possibly be. Nietzsche hurried down the wood-paneled hall outside the library, her feet swishing across thick carpets, using her sense of her gifted connection with Richard to guide her, letting that thread of magic take her where it may, rather than trying to deliberately remember and find her way through the keep. As she made her way ever closer to him, she reminisced about the kiss she had given him to link them so that she could find him. She felt rather guilty about that kiss, even if it had been achingly wonderful to do it. It had been far more than she needed to do. She could have simply touched a finger to the back of his hand or a shoulder and established a link without him feeling a thing. But Kara had just been telling her how maybe she needed to make him more aware of her and filled her mind with heady thoughts of the possibilities. That kiss would certainly have planted her firmly in his thoughts. In a way, though, she felt it was too forward, considering his mental state. He was in love with someone else, even if it was a dream, and Nietzsche hadn't respected that. She regretted, in a way, giving him that kiss. In another way, she wished she had planted it on his lips instead of his cheek, as Shota had done. It burned her to hear Kara telling them how Shota had kissed him and tried to get him to stay with her. Nietzsche knew how the witch woman felt, but that didn't make her any happier about it. Nietzsche would give anything to be able to hold him now, to comfort him, to tell him that it would be all right for no other reason than simply to try to make him feel just a little better to reassure him that there were others around who cared about him. But she knew that this was not the time or circumstances for such things. At the same time, she knew that this could not continue. He simply could not go on like this. His life could not stay in this static state, drifting without his conscious direction. He had to come to his senses. Nietzsche hurried onward, quickening her pace, down the endless maze of halls and through empty but grand rooms, suddenly feeling, for some reason, the urgent need to be with him. Richard stood at the brink of the wall, an arm resting on a massive merlin to each side, as he stared out through the crenellation. It felt like standing at the edge of the world. Gray patches of shade drifted slowly over the hills and fields far below as their mothering clouds shepherded them along. He seemed to have lost all track of time. Every day had become the same monotonous, pointless, empty existence. 
He didn't even know how long he had been standing at the gap in the wall, staring out at nothing in particular. With Kalin dead and gone, nothing mattered anymore. He had trouble imagining why it ever had. He couldn't even imagine for sure now that she had ever been real. But whether or not she had been, it was over. Kara was close. She was always close. In a way, it was comforting, knowing that he could depend on her for anything. In some ways, though, it was wearing to have her always there, so that he was never able to have a moment's privacy. He wondered if she believed she was close enough to snatch him if he jumped. He knew that she wasn't. He gazed at the tiny little roofs crowded together in the city of Adendril far below. In a way, he felt an affinity for the city. It was empty. He was empty. Life was gone from both of them. Since digging up the grave, he couldn't bring himself to call it Kalin's grave, even in his own mind, much less out loud, he didn't think there was anything worth being alive for anymore. If a person could die by sheer will alone, he would already be dead. But death, when invited, had suddenly grown shy. The days dragged endlessly on. He had been so stunned by that grave that it seemed his mind had been scrambled on the spot. It felt like he had lost his ability to think. Nothing he knew made sense to him. The things he'd thought were true somehow no longer were. His whole world had been turned upside down. How could he function if he couldn't tell what was real and what wasn't? He didn't know what else to do. For the first time in his life, he was baffled and defeated by the way things were. He always seemed to have a variety of options that he knew he could try. Now he didn't. He had tried everything he could think of. None of it worked. He was at the end of his rope, and there was none left. And all the time in his mind, he kept seeing her body in the coffin. He saw, he heard, he felt, but he could not think, could not put anything together in a meaningful way. It was a walking, living imitation of death, a poor one, he believed. What good was living if it felt this way? He longed only for that dark, forever embrace of nothingness to take him. He was so far beyond hurt, beyond sadness, beyond grief, that there was only an unthinking, empty, blind, confused agony that never for a second would release him enough to get a breath. He wanted desperately to escape the truth, to refuse to allow it to be real, but he couldn't, and it was suffocating him. The wind coming up the mountain ruffled his hair as he stared out over a precipitous drop of thousands of feet. What good was he to anyone? He'd let Zed down. He'd given Shota the sword of truth for nothing of value. Nietzsche thought he was out of his mind, that he was delusional. Not even Kara believed him, really believed him. He was the only one who believed him and he had proved himself wrong by digging up her grave. He guessed he must be crazy, that Nietzsche had to be right. Everyone was right. He could only be imagining things. He could see it in all their eyes the way they looked at him, that he had lost his mind. Richard gazed down the sheer drop of the dark stones of the massive outer keep wall, they fell away below him for thousands of feet toward the rock and forest below. Gusts of wind coming up the face of the wall buffeted him. It was a dizzying sight, a dizzying drop. What good was he to anyone, most of all to himself? He stole a sidelong glance at Kara. She was close, but not nearly close enough. Richard didn't see any reason to continue the agony. He didn't have his mind, and his mind was life. He didn't have Kalin. She was his life. From what everyone told him, from what he saw in the coffin that terrible night, he never had her. It was all just a mad delusion, a wish, a whim. 
He glanced down again at the forever drop off the towering wall on the side of the keep, at the rocks and trees spread out below. It was a very, very long way down. He recalled people saying that just before you died, you relived your life. If he were to relive his life, he would relive every precious moment he'd had with Kalen, or thought he'd had. It was a long way down. A long time to relive such wonderful, romantic, loving times. A long time to relive every precious moment he'd spent with her. Chapter 50 Nietzsche opened an iron-strapped oak door to bright daylight. Puffy white clouds skimmed by just overhead in a sparkling azure sky that on any other day would have lifted her spirits. A fresh breeze carried her hair across her face. She pulled it away as she gazed down the narrow bridge to a rampart in the distance. Richard stood beyond the end of the bridge, at the far wall of the rampart, in the gap of the crenellation, looking down the mountain. Kara, nearby, turned when she heard the door. Nietzsche hurried across the bridge above courtyards far below. She could see several stone benches down among the rose garden at the bottom of a tower and juncture of several walls. When she finally reached Richard's side, he glanced over, giving her a brief small smile. It warmed her to see it, even though she knew the smile was little more than a polite formality. Rika came and told me that someone approaches the keep. I thought I should come and get you. Kara, standing only three strides away, stepped a little closer. Does Rika know who it is? Nietzsche shook her head. I'm afraid not, and I'm more than a little worried. Without moving or taking his eyes from the distant countryside, Richard said, It's Anne and Nathan. Nietzsche's eyebrows lifted in surprise. She looked over the edge. Richard pointed them out far below on the road that wound its way up the mountain toward the keep. There are three riders, Nietzsche said. Richard nodded. It looks like it might be Tom with them. Nietzsche leaned out a little farther past Richard and peered down the face of the stone wall. It was a frightening drop. The feeling came over her that she didn't at all like where he was standing. With a hand on his shoulder to steady herself, Nietzsche looked out again at the three horses plodding their way up the sunlit road. They briefly disappeared under trees only to emerge a moment later as they continued steadily up toward the keep. A gust of wind suddenly threatened to unbalance her from her footing in the slot in the immense stone wall. Before it could, Richard's arm around her waist steadied her. She instinctively drew back from the edge. Once she was on safe footing, his protective arm released her. You can tell for sure from here that it's Anne and Nathan, she asked. Yes. Nietzsche wasn't especially enthusiastic about seeing the prelate again. As a sister of the light, and having lived at the Palace of the Prophets for most of her life, Nietzsche had had just about all she wanted of the sisters and their leader. In many ways, the prelate was a mother figure to her, as she had been to all the sisters someone who was there to remind them whenever they were a disappointment and lecture them that they had to redouble their efforts to help others in need. When she had been young, should self-interest ever rear its ugly head, Nietzsche's mother had always been at the ready to bitterly slap it down. Later in Nietzsche's life, the prelate served in that same capacity, if with a kindly smile. Slap or smile, it was the same thing. Servitude even if under a nicer name. Nathan Rawl was another matter. She didn't really know the prophet. There were sisters, and novices especially, who trembled at the mere mention of his name. From what everyone always said, though, he was not simply dangerous, but possibly deranged, which, if true, had disturbing implications for Richard's present condition. The prophet had been held in secure quarters almost his entire life. The sisters seeing not only to his needs, but seeing to it that he never escaped. People in the city of Tanamura, where the palace had been, were both titillated and terrified of the prophet, of what he might tell them of the future. 
Whispers were among the people of the city that he was most surely wicked, since he could tell them things about their future. Ability tended to arouse the ire of a great many people, especially when that ability was not one that could easily be made to serve their wants. Nietzsche wasn't much worried about what people said about Nathan, though. She'd had experience with truly dangerous people, with Jagang only the most recent to grace the top of her list of the wicked. We'd better get down there, Nietzsche told Richard and Kara. Richard stared out over the countryside. You go on if you want. He sounded like he couldn't have cared less that someone was coming or who it was. It was obvious that his mind was elsewhere, and he only wanted her to go away. Nietzsche pulled a flag of hair back off her face. Don't you think you ought to see what they want? After all, they must have traveled a long way to get here. I'm sure they didn't come bringing milk and cakes. Richard shrugged one shoulder, showing no reaction to her attempt at humor. Zed can see to it. Nietzsche so missed the light in Richard's eyes. She was at the end of her endurance of the situation. She glanced over at the moored Sith and spoke in quiet but unmistakable command. Kara, why don't you go for a little walk, please? Kara, surprised by such an unusual but clear directive coming from Nietzsche, took in Richard standing at the opening in the wall, staring off into the distance, and then gave Nietzsche a conspiratorial nod. Nietzsche watched Kara walk off down the rampart before finally addressing Richard again, but this time in a boldly forthright manner. Richard, you have to stop this. As he gazed out at the vast scene below, he didn't answer. Nietzsche knew that she couldn't allow herself to fail in what she had to say, what she had to accomplish, she would do almost anything to have Richard care about having her in his life, but she didn't want to win him this way. She didn't want to be second best to a corpse or a substitute to a dream he couldn't make real. If she was ever to have him, she would only have him because he chose her, not because he was left with nothing else. There had been a time when she would have accepted on those grounds, but no more. She respected herself more than that now, and all because of Richard. But even more than that, this was not the Richard she knew and loved. Even if she could never have him, she still wouldn't allow him to sink to the terribly dark place he was in. If she could give him a needed push back up toward life, and that was all she could ever do for him, then she would. Even if she had to play the role of antagonist to get him out of his downward spiral, and she could be no more than that to him, then she would. She laid a hand on the stone Merlin, making herself impossible to avoid, and took an even more confrontational tone. Aren't you going to fight for what you believe in? They can fight if they want. His voice didn't sound despondent. It sounded dead. That's not what I mean. Nietzsche grasped his arm and gently but firmly pulled him around, turning him from the drop-off, forcing him to face her. Aren't you going to fight for yourself? He met her gaze, but didn't answer. This is because Zed told you that he was disappointed in you. I think the grave I dug up might have had a bit to do with it. You may think so, but I don't. Why should it? You have been devastated and sent reeling by things before. I captured you and took you away to the old world, and what did you do? You stood up for yourself and acted like yourself and on your beliefs, within the limits of what I would allow you to do. By being who you are, you exerted your love of life, and that changed my life. You showed me the truth of the joy of life and all it means. This time you woke up from nearly dying to me and Kara and everyone else not believing in your memory of Kalin, but that never stopped you. You kept arguing your convictions despite everything we said. What was in that coffin is different and I'd say a little more than a simple argument when someone doesn't believe you. Is it? I don't think so. It was a skeleton. So what? So what? Annoyance crept into his features. Are you out of your mind? What do you mean, so what? Far be it from me to argue your case when I don't believe in it, 
but I don't seek to win you to what I believe is the truth by default. I would want to win you over with the true facts, not with this flimsy evidence. What do you mean? Well, was it Kaylin's face you saw to prove to you that it really was her? No, it couldn't be. There was no face left, just a skull. No face, no eyes, no features. The skeleton was wearing the dress of the mother confessor. So what? I was in the confessor's palace and there were other dresses there like that. So, was a name stitched on a gold ribbon enough to prove it to you? Enough to bring you to an end of your search, your beliefs? After all the things that Kara and I have said to you, have argued to you, have reasoned to you, you all of a sudden feel that this flimsy evidence proves you delusional? A skeleton in a coffin holding a ribbon with her name stitched on it is enough to suddenly convince you that you dreamed her up? just as we've been telling you all along and you've refused to believe? Don't you think that the ribbon is just a little too convenient? Richard frowned at her. What are you getting at? I don't believe that's what is really going on with you. I think you're wrong about your memories, but I don't believe that the Richard I know could be convinced by the dubious evidence in that grave. This isn't even because Zed doesn't believe your memories any more than Kara and I do. Then what's it about? This is all because you believed a corpse in a coffin was her because you were afraid it was true after your grandfather said that he was disappointed in you and that you let him down. Richard started to turn away, but Nietzsche seized his shirt and pulled him back, forcing him to face her. That's what I think this is about, she said with fierce resolve. You're sulking because your grandfather said you were wrong, said that you disappointed him. Maybe because I did. So what? Richard's face screwed up in confusion. What do you mean, so what? I mean, so what if he's disappointed in you? So what if he thinks you did a stupid thing? You're your own man. You did what you reasoned you had to do. You acted because you thought you had to act and do the things you did. But I... You what? You disappointed him? You made him angry at what you decided to do? He thought more of you and you let him down? You came up short in his eyes? Richard swallowed, not wanting to admit it aloud. Nietzsche lifted his chin and made him look into her eyes. Richard, you have no responsibility to live up to anyone else's expectations. He blinked at her, looking speechless. It's your life, she insisted. You're the one who taught me that. You did what you thought you must. Did you turn down Shota's offer because Kara disagreed with you? No. Would you have turned down Shota's offer if you knew I thought you were wrong to give her your sword? Or would you have turned her down if both of us told you that you'd be a fool to accept? No, I don't think so. And why not? Because you were doing what you thought you must do. And as much as you would hope we would agree with you, in the end, it didn't matter what we thought. Your conviction was what you had to act upon. You didn't quail at the decision, you acted. You did what you felt you had to do. You were making the decision based on what you believed, for reasons only you can truly know, and that it was the right thing to do. Isn't that correct? Well, yes. Then what difference should it make if your grandfather thinks you're wrong? Was he there? Does he know everything you knew at the time? It would be nice if he believed in what you did, if he supported you and said, good for you, Richard, but he didn't. Does that suddenly make your decision wrong? Does it? No. Then you can't let it take over your mind. Sometimes the people who love us the most have the highest expectations for us and sometimes those expectations are idealized. You did what you had to do, given what you believed and what you know, to find the answers you needed to solve the problem. If everyone else in the world thinks you're wrong, but you believe you're right, you have to act on what you have sound reason to believe. Numbers of those against you don't change the facts, and you must act to find the facts, not satisfy the crowd or any particular individual, you have no responsibility to live up to anyone else's expectations, 
you have only to live up to your own expectations. Some of the light, the fire, was back in his intent gray eyes. Does this mean that you believe me, Nietzsche? She sadly shook her head. No, Richard, I think your belief in Kaylin is a result of your injury. I think you dreamed her up. And the grave? The truth? When he nodded, Nietzsche took a deep breath. I think that is the real mother confessor, Kaylin Amnell. I see. Nietzsche seized his jaw again and made him look back at her. But that doesn't mean that I'm right. I'm basing my belief on other things, things I know. But I don't think that anything I saw in that coffin, as much as I believe it's her, really proves it. I've been wrong in my life before. You've thought I'm wrong all along in this. Are you going to do as someone says who you think is wrong? Why would you do that? But it's so hard when no one believes me. Sure it is, but so what? That doesn't make them right and you wrong. But when everyone says you're wrong, it starts to make you have doubts. Yes, sometimes life is really hard. In the past, doubts have always made you dig all the harder for the truth, to be sure you were right because knowing the truth can give you the strength to fight on. This time your shock at seeing a body in the mother confessor's grave when you hadn't anticipated even the possibility of one being there, coupled with your grandfather's unexpectedly harsh comments right in that moment of horror, overwhelmed you. I can understand how it was the last straw and you couldn't fight it anymore. Everyone can sometimes reach the limits of their endurance and give up, even you, Richard Rahl. You are mortal and you have your limits just like everyone else does. But you have to deal with that and move on. You've had time to temporarily give up, but now you have to take control of your own life again. She could see him thinking, considering. It was a thrilling sight to see Richard's mind back and working. She could still see, though, his hesitation. She didn't want him to come this far and slip back now. People must have not believed you before in other things, she said. Weren't there ever times when this Kalin of yours didn't believe you? A real person would have sometimes disagreed with you, doubted you, argued with you. And when that happened, you must have done as you thought you had to, even though she thought you were wrong, maybe even a little crazy. I mean, come on, Richard, this isn't the first time I thought you were crazy. Richard smiled briefly before thinking it over. Then a broad grin spread on his face. Yes, there certainly were times like that with Kaylin when she didn't believe me. And you still did as you believed you had to, didn't you? Richard, still smiling, nodded. Then don't let this incident with your grandfather ruin your life. He lifted an arm and let it flop back down. But it's just that you gave up because of what Zed told you without even using what you got from Shota. He looked up sharply, his attention suddenly riveted on her. What do you mean? In exchange for the sword of truth, Shota gave you information to help you find the truth. One of the things she told you was, what you seek is long buried. But that's not all. Kara told Zed and me everything Shota said. Apparently the most vital thing she gave you, because it was the first, and almost all she thought she had to tell you was the word chain fire. Right? Richard nodded as he listened. She then told you that you must find the place of the bones in the deep nothing. Shota also told you to beware the viper with four heads. What is chain fire? What is the deep nothing? What is the viper with four heads? You paid a dear price for that information, Richard. What have you done with it? You came here and asked Zed if he knew, and he said no. Then he told you that he was disappointed in you. So what? Are you going to throw away everything you've gained in your search just because of that? Because an old man who has no idea what Kalin means to you, or what you've been through the last couple of years, thinks that you acted foolishly? Do you want to move in here and be his lapdog? Do you want to stop thinking and just depend on him to do your thinking for you? Of course not. At the grave, Zed was angry. He went through things we probably can't imagine to get the sword of truth away from Shota. 
What would you expect him to say? Oh, yes, that's a good idea, Richard. Just give it back to her, that's fine. He had a lot invested in getting that sword back from her, and he thought you made a foolish trade. So what? That's his view. Maybe he's even right. But you thought it was important enough to sacrifice something he had entrusted to you alone, something very precious to you, in order to gain a higher value. You believed that it was a fair trade. Kara said that at first you even thought Shota might be cheating you, but then you came to believe that she had given you fair value. Did Kara tell it true? Richard nodded. What did Shota tell you about your bargain? Richard gazed up at the soaring towers behind Nietzsche as he recalled the words. Shota said, You wanted what I know that can help you find the truth. I have given it to you. Chain fire. Whether or not you realize it right now, I have given you a fair trade. I have given you the answers you needed. You are the seeker, or at least you were. You will have to seek the meaning to be found in those answers. And do you believe her? Richard considered a moment, his gaze dropping away. I do. When he looked back up into her eyes, the spark of life was again blazing there. I do believe her. Then you should tell me and Kara and your grandfather that if none of us are going to help you, then we ought to get out of your way and let you do as you must. He smiled, if somewhat sadly. You're a pretty remarkable woman, Nietzsche, to convince me to keep fighting even when you don't believe in what I'm fighting for. He leaned in and kissed her on the cheek. I truly wish I could, Richard, for your sake. I know. Thank you, my friend. And I say friend because only a true friend would be more concerned with helping me face reality than what it means for her. He reached out and, with his hand cupped to her face, used a thumb to wipe a tear from her cheek. You have done more for me than you know, Nietzsche. Thank you. Nietzsche felt giddy joy mixed with sinking frustration that they were right back to where they had started. Still, she wanted to throw her arms around him, but instead she simply cupped both her hands over his on the side of her face. Now, he said, I think we had better go see about Anne and Nathan, and then I need to find out what part chain fire plays in all this. Will you help me? Nietzsche smiled as she nodded, too choked up to speak, and then, unable to stop herself, at last threw her arms around him, and clutched him tightly to her. Chapter 51 The look on Anne's face as she stepped in the big door and saw Nietzsche entering the anteroom from between two red pillars was priceless. Nietzsche would have laughed aloud had her talk with Richard not so emotionally drained her. The prophet, Nietzsche knew, was very old, but he was by no means feeble-looking. He was tall and broad-shouldered, with distinguished white hair that hung to his shoulders. He looked like a man who could bend iron, and he wouldn't even need his gift to do so. It was the raptor gaze of his dark azure eyes, though, that made him at once intimidating and alluring. They were the eyes of a Rall. Anne stared, her own eyes wide. Sister Nietzsche! The prelate didn't say, so good to see you again, or anything cordial. She seemed momentarily unable to think of what to say. Nietzsche found it just a little remarkable that this squat woman beside the towering prophet had for so long seemed so big in her eyes. Novices and sisters often went for long periods without even seeing the prelate around the palace of the prophets. Absence, Nietzsche guessed, added to her mythic stature. Prelate. I'm glad to see you well, especially after your unfortunate death and funeral. Nietzsche glanced over at Richard as she finished the thought. I hear that everyone believed you were dead. Amazing how a burial can be so convincing, and yet here you are, alive and well, it would appear. Richard's twitch of a smile told her that he caught her meaning. Zed to the side at the brink of the three steps leading down into the center of the room with the fountain gave Nietzsche a curious frown. The meaning hadn't been lost on him, either. Yes, well, that was unfortunately necessary, child. 
Anne's expression darkened. What with the sisters of the dark having infested the ranks of our sisters of the light? She glanced briefly at Richard, Kara, and Zed, the edge of her countenance softening. It appears by the company you keep, Sister Nietzsche, that you have come back into the fold. I can't tell you how much it pleases me personally. I can only think that the Creator himself must have had a hand in saving your soul. Nietzsche clasped her hands behind her back. The Creator had nothing to do with it, actually. I guess that while I was forced to spend my life serving everyone who decided they wanted the blood and sweat of my abilities, the Creator was busy. I guess he couldn't be bothered while I was being used by pious men telling me how it was my duty to serve and to submit and to grovel to them and to kill those who opposed the Creator's ways. I guess that all the times those champions of the Creator were raping me, the Creator didn't catch on to the irony. No more. Richard helped show me the value of my life to myself. And it is no longer Sister Nietzsche, either of the light or the dark. Nor is it Death's mistress or the slave queen. It is just Nietzsche now, if you please, and even if you don't. Anne's expression flashed between incredulity and indignation as her face went red. But once you are a sister, you are always a sister. You have done a wonderful thing and renounced the Keeper, so you are again a Sister of the Light. You can't simply decide on your own to forsake your duty to the Creators. If he has any objections, then let him speak up right now. As the echo of Nietzsche's heated words faded away, the room fell silent, but for the splash of water in the fountain. She made a show of looking around, as if she thought that maybe the Creator might be hiding behind a pillar, ready to pop out and make his wishes known. No? She again clasped her hands. She put back on the defiant smile. Well then, since he has no objections, Nietzsche it is, I guess. I'll not have... Anne, enough, Nathan said in a deep, commanding voice. We have important business, and this isn't it. We didn't travel all this way simply for a dead prelate to lecture a reformed sister of the dark. Nietzsche was somewhat surprised to hear the voice of reason coming from the prophet. She allowed that perhaps she had put too much stock into idle gossip. Anne's mouth twisted in resignation as she fingered a stray lock of hair into the loose bun at the back of her head. I suppose you're right. I'm afraid that I'm a little out of sorts, my dear, what with all the trouble going on. Please forgive my rash presumption, will you, Nietzsche? Nietzsche bowed her head. Happily, prelate. Anne smiled, more genuinely, Nietzsche thought. And it's just Anne now. Verna is prelate now. I'm dead, remember? Nietzsche smiled. So you are, Anne. Wise choice, Verna. Sister Cecilia always said that there was no hope of converting that one to the Keeper. Some day, when we have the luxury of time, I would appreciate hearing more about Sister Cecilia, in addition to Richard's former teachers. She sighed at the thought. I never knew for sure that you and all five of the others were Sisters of the Dark. Nietzsche nodded. I'd be happy to tell you what I know about them. The one still alive, anyway. Liliana and Marissa are dead. Tom, how is my sister? Richard asked as soon as there was a brief break in the conversation. Nietzsche recognized that he had listened long enough and was signaling that he wanted to move on to more important matters. She is well, Lord Rall, the big blonde-headed man near the door said. Good. Nathan, what's going on? Richard anxiously asked, getting right to the point. What trouble are you here about? Well, among other things, prophecy trouble. Richard visibly relaxed. Oh, well, that's not something I can help you with. I wouldn't be so sure, Nathan said cryptically. Zed stepped off the gold and red carpet and down into the room. Let me guess. You're here about the blank places in the books of prophecy. Nietzsche had to run Zed's words through her mind a second time, before she was sure she'd heard him right. Nathan nodded. 
You've just sat down in the middle of the muck. What do you mean you hear about blank places in the books of prophecy? Richard looked suddenly suspicious. What blank places? Extensive sections of prophecy, that is, prophecy written down in the books of prophecy, have simply vanished off the pages of a number of the books we've so far inspected. Nathan's brow bunched in an expression of apprehension. We've checked with Verna, and she confirmed that the books of prophecy at the People's Palace in Dahara are suffering the same inexplicable problem. Therein lies the heart of our worry. We came in part to see if the works of prophecy here at the Keep are still intact. I'm afraid not, Zed said. The books here have been similarly corrupted. Nathan swiped a hand across his tired face. Dear spirits, he murmured, we had been holding out hope that whatever is causing such havoc among the prophecies had not affected the books here as well. You mean that entire sections of prophecy are missing? Richard asked, stepping down into the heart of the room. That's right, Nathan confirmed. Would there happen to be a pattern to the missing prophecy? Richard asked suddenly focusing on a line of reasoning that Nietzsche knew would end up being somehow related to his own search. Ordinarily, she would have been frustrated or even annoyed that he could think of nothing else but his fixation with the missing woman, but this time she was heartened to see that the familiar Richard was back. Why, yes, there is a pattern. They are all prophecies having to do with events beginning roughly around the time of your birth. Richard stared, dumbfounded. What are the missing prophecies about? Specifically. I mean, are they related to specific events? Or are they non-specific and instead share only a time period? Nathan stroked his chin as he considered the question. That's the thing that makes this so strange. Many of the prophecies that are missing we know we should be able to recall, but they are suddenly and completely just as blank in our minds as they are on the page. We can't remember a single word of them. We don't recall what they were about, and since they're gone from the books as well, I can't tell you if they were event-related or time-related or something else. We realize that they are missing, but that's about all. Richard's eyes turned to Nietzsche as if to ask if she caught the correlation. She thought he could see that she did. His voice remained casual, but Nietzsche knew how intent was the interest behind his words. Pretty odd that something you've known all your lives can just vanish right out of your memory, wouldn't you say? I certainly would, Nathan said. Any thoughts on the subject, Zed? Zed, who had been silently and intently watching Richard, nodded. Well, I know what's causing it, if that will help you out. He smiled innocently. Nietzsche noticed that Rika, standing in the shadows back behind the red pillars, smiled as well. Nathan, at first stunned, became animated with curiosity. Richard gently tugged Zed's robes at his shoulder. You know? You do, Nathan asked, urging Richard back out of the way as he stepped closer. Anne rushed forward with him. What is it? What's happening? Tell us. A prophecy worm, I'm afraid. Nathan and Anne blinked, their faces blank of any comprehension. A what? Nathan finally ventured, somewhat cautiously, if not suspiciously. The text vanishing is caused by a prophecy worm. Once a fork of prophecy is infected with this scourge, it worms its way entirely through that branch, consuming it as it goes. Since it consumes the actual prophecy itself, that means that over time, all manifestations of it, such as the written prophecy or any memory of it, are destroyed. It's quite virulent. Zed regarded their rapt stares with another polite smile. If you want, I can show you the reference work. I should say so, Nathan said. Zed, this is important, Richard said. Why haven't you said something? Zed gave him a familiar clap on the shoulder as he started away. Well, my boy, when you arrived, you weren't much in the mood to listen to anything but what you were here about, remember? You were rather insistent that you had trouble, and you needed to talk to me about it. Since then, you haven't exactly been willing to talk. 
You've been rather distracted. I guess I was. Richard caught his grandfather's arm, halting him before he could get far. Zed, look, I need to tell you something about all of that and about that night. Like what, my boy? I know that a contradiction cannot exist. I never really thought you did, Richard. But there was more to it that night. The rule most involved down there at the gravesite was not the one you quoted. It may have seemed that way to you at the moment, but the rule I made a mistake about was another. The one that says in part that people can be made to believe a lie because they fear that it's true. That's what I was doing. I wasn't believing a contradiction. I was believing a lie because I was so afraid it was true. The rule of non-contradiction is one of the ways I should have checked my assumptions. I didn't, and in that I made a mistake. I understand what it must have looked like to you since you weren't aware of everything that's been happening, but that doesn't mean I should have stopped looking for the truth out of a misplaced wish to make you happy or out of fear of what you would think of me. He met Nietzsche's gaze for a brief moment. Nietzsche helped me see what I was doing wrong. He looked back at his grandfather. I think you meant to show me that the rule you quoted is more, though. It also means you can't hold contradictory values or goals. You can't say, for instance, that honesty is a meaningful value and at the same time lie to people. You can't say that justice is your goal, but refuse to hold the guilty responsible for their actions. At the heart of our struggle, the fact that contradictions can't exist is why the imperial order's regime is so ruinous. They hold up altruism as their highest purpose, yet out of their proclaimed selfless concern for one individual, they sacrifice another, soothing over the bloodletting by proclaiming that such a sacrifice is the moral duty of the sacrificial victim. It's really nothing more than organized looting, a passion for the happiness of thieves and murderers without any concern for their victim. Attempts at goals that depend on such contradiction can only lead to widespread suffering and death. It's the fraudulent advocacy of the right to life by embracing death as a means to achieve it. The rule you quoted means I can't, like Jagang's followers, say I want the truth and then, without checking my assumption, willingly believe a lie in its stead, even if out of fear. That's the way I violated the rule you quoted. I should have sorted out what looked like contradictions and found the truth staring me in the face. That's where I let myself down. Are you saying that you now don't believe that was Kaelin Amnell? Zed asked. Who says that corpse has to be the woman you think it is? There were no facts there to contradict my belief that it wasn't her. I only believed there were out of fear that it was true. It wasn't. Zed took a deep breath, letting it out slowly. You're stretching things mighty thin, Richard. Am I? You wouldn't be too pleased with my rationale if I said that there is no such thing as prophecy and held up the blank books as proof that your belief in the existence of prophecy is wrong. For you to believe that prophecy exists in the face of the fact that the supposed books of prophecy are blank is not a contradiction. It is a perplexing situation with insufficient information to as of yet explain the facts. You have no obligation to reach a conclusion or hold an opinion you don't accept for other reasons without adequate information or before you have finished investigating. What kind of seeker would I be if I did that? After all, it's the mind of the man that makes him the seeker, not the sword. The sword is merely a tool. You're the one who told me that. In the case of Kalin, there are still too many unanswered questions for me to be convinced that what we saw that rainy night is really the truth. Until it's proved one way or another, I'm going to continue to look for the answers, for the truth, because I believe that what is going on is far more dangerous than anyone but me realizes, to say nothing of needing to find a person I love who needs my help. Zed smiled in a grandfatherly way. Fair enough, Richard, fair enough but I expect you to prove it to me. I won't take your word for it. Richard gave his grandfather a firm nod. For starters, 
I think you have to admit it's rather suspicious that prophecies revolving around Kalin's and my lives are missing. The memory of her is gone, now the prophecies are gone that would have to contain reference to her. In both cases, everyone's memory of both real entities, the person, and the prophecies referring to that real person, have been wiped away. Do you see what I'm getting at? Nietzsche was immeasurably relieved to see that Richard was thinking rationally again. She was also concerned that in a strange way what he said actually did make some sense. Yes, my boy, I do see your point. But do you see that there is a problem with your theory? What's that? We all remember you, now don't we? And the prophecies about you are missing. As it turns out, in this case, the problem with prophecy doesn't have anything at all to do with what you are hoping will explain or prove the existence of Kalen Amnell. Why not? Richard asked. Zed started up the steps. It has to do with the nature of what I found out when I did my own investigation of the problem with the books of prophecy. I'm not without my own sense of curiosity, you know. I know that, Zed. But it could be connected. Richard insisted as he walked along beside his grandfather. Nietzsche hurried after him. Everyone else was forced to fall in behind. It might seem that way to you, my boy, but your speculation is flawed because all the facts just don't fit your conclusion. You're trying to wear boots that look good but are too small. Zed clapped Richard on the shoulder. When we get to the library, I'll show you what I mean. Who's Kalen? Nathan asked. Someone who vanished, and I haven't found yet, Richard said over his shoulder, but I will. Richard paused and turned back to Anne and Nathan. Do either of you know what chain fire is? They both shook their heads. How about a viper with four heads, or the deep nothing? I'm afraid not, Richard, Anne said, but as long as we're on the subject of important matters, we do have other things we need to speak with you about. After we see Zed's reference about prophecy, Nathan said. Well, come on then, Zed told them as he started off with a flourish of his simple robes. Chapter 52 In the plush library, Richard stood behind Zed, watching over his grandfather's bony shoulder as he flipped open a thick book bound in tattered tan leather. The room was rather dimly lit by a number of silver reflector lamps on all four sides of five thick mahogany posts standing in a line down the center of the room. They held up the leading edge of a balcony running the length of the room. Heavy, dark wooden tables with polished tops lined the center of the room down the line of posts. Wooden chairs were spaced around the outside of the tables. Opulent carpets with elaborately woven patterns felt soft and quiet underfoot. Perpendicular to the long walls on each side were aisles of shelves packed with books. Above, the balcony held closely spaced shelves filled with yet more volumes. A gray-blue shaft of sunlight slanting in from the single window up high at the very end of the room lit the dust floating in the stuffy air the freshly lit lamps added an oily smell. The room had a vault-like quiet about it. Kara and Rika stood off by themselves in the darker area beneath the window at the end of the room, arms folded, heads together, talking in low voices. Nietzsche stood beside Zed along one edge of a table lit in a glowing rectangle of sunlight, while Anne and Nathan stood impatiently on the opposite side, waiting for Zed's explanation of how prophecy had vanished. Standing there, in the island of light, the rest of the room faded away into gloomy shadows around them. This book was compiled, I believe, sometime not long after the Great War had ended, Zed told them as he tapped the open cover near the title, Continuum Ratios and Viability Predictions. The gifted back then had discovered that, for whatever reason, fewer and fewer wizards were being born and the ones who were being born were not being born with both sides of the gift, as had almost always been the case before. What's more, the ones who were being born with the gift were all being born with only the additive side, 
subtractive was vanishing. Anne looked up from under her brow. It is hardly a novice and a boy wizard standing before you, old man. We know all this. We have spent our lives devoted to this very problem. Get on with it. Zed cleared his throat. Yes, well, as you may know, this also meant that there were fewer and fewer prophets being born. How remarkably fascinating, Anne mocked. I, for one, would never have guessed such a thing. Nathan irritably hushed her. Go on, Zed. Zed pushed back his sleeves, briefly casting a scowl Anne's way. They realized that with ever fewer wizards born to prophecy, the body of work of prophecy was, of course, going to cease to grow. In order to understand what the consequences of this might mean, they decided that they needed to do an intensive investigation of the entire subject of prophecy while they still could, while they still had prophets and other wizards with both sides of the gift. They approached the problem with the gravest of concern, realizing that with them, this might very well be mankind's last opportunity to comprehend the future of prophecy itself and to offer future generations an insight to understanding what these wizards were increasingly coming to believe would one day be seriously corrupted or even lost. Zed glanced up to see if Anne looked like she intended to offer any more disparaging comments. She did not. This was apparently something she hadn't known. Now, he said, to their work. Richard moved up to the table beside Nietzsche and with a finger turned over pages as he listened to Zed. He quickly noticed that the book was written in such strange technical jargon having to do with the intricacies of not only magic, but prophecy as well, that it was nearly incomprehensible to him. It might as well have been a different language. One of the surprises was that the book contained a series of complex mathematical formulas. These were interrupted by diagrams of the moon and stars, marked with angles of declination. Richard had never before seen a book about magic that contained such equations, celestial observations, and measurements. Not that he had actually seen that many books about magic, although he recalled the book of counted shadows that he had memorized as a boy did have a number of sun and star angles that were necessary to know in order to open the boxes of Orden. Yet more formulas were scratched in the margins, but by different hands, as if someone had come along and done the sums to check the work in the book, or perhaps approached it with updated information. In one instance, several of the numbers in an elaborate table were crossed out, with arrows pointing from new numbers scribbled in the margins to the stricken numbers in the tables. Zed occasionally stopped Richard from turning pages in order to point out an equation and explain the symbols involved in the calculation. Like a dog watching a bone, Nathan's dark azure eyes tracked the pages as Richard slowly turned each over, idly looking for anything that made sense to him as Zed droned on about overlapping transpositional forks and triple duplexes bound to conjugated roots compromised by precession and sequential proportional binary inversions shrouding flawed bifurcations that the formulas revealed which could only be detected through subtractive levorotatory. Nathan and Anne stared without blinking. Once Nathan even gasped. Anne incrementally went ashen. Even Nietzsche seemed to be listening with uncharacteristic attention. The unfathomable concepts made Richard's head spin he hated that feeling of drowning in incomprehensible information, of trying to keep his head above the dark waters of complete confusion. It made him feel dumb. Intermittently, Zed referred to numbers and equations from the book. Nathan and Anne acted like they thought Zed was on the verge of revealing not only how the world was going to end, but the precise hour. Zed, Richard finally asked, interrupting his grandfather in the middle of a sentence that showed no signs of ever coming to an end. Is there any way you can boil this stew down to some meat that I can chew? Mouth agape, Zed regarded Richard for a moment before pushing the book across the table to Nathan. I'll let you read it for yourself. Nathan cautiously picked up the book as if the keeper himself might pop out at him. Zed turned back to Richard. Basically, to put it in terms you might better grasp, 
and at great risk of oversimplifying it, imagine that prophecy is like a tree with roots and branches. Like a tree, prophecy was continually growing. What these wizards were basically saying was that the tree of prophecy behaved as if there were a kind of life to it. They weren't saying that it was alive, mind you, only that in a number of ways it mimicked, not duplicated, some attributes of a living organism. It was this property that allowed them to come up with their theory and from that run their calculations, in much the way there are parameters by which you can judge the age and health of a tree and from that extrapolate about its future. During a previous time when there had been a great many prophets and wizards around, the works of prophecy and its many branches grew quite rapidly. With all the prophets who had contributed, it had solid, fertile ground in which to grow and deep roots. With new prophets constantly bringing new vision to the collected works, new forks of prophecy sprouted continuously. And those new branches over time, as other prophets added to them, grew thick and strong. As it grew, prophets continually examined, observed, and interpreted events, enabling them to tend the living stock and prune the dead wood. But then the birth rate of prophets began to plummet, and with each passing year there were fewer and fewer of them to attend to such duties. Because of this, the growth of the tree of prophecy began to slow. In essence, to explain it in simple terms you can understand. The tree of prophecy had in a way matured, like an old monarch oak in a forest. These wizards knew that the vast tree of prophecy had many years of life ahead of it as a mature entity, but they also knew what the future eventually held in store. Like all things, the existence of prophecy could not be eternal. As time passed, prophetic events came to pass, becoming outdated. These no longer served any use. In this fashion, if nothing else, the passage of time would eventually supersede all the predictions dealt with in the work. In other words, without new prophecy, all the existing prophecy, whether or not they turned out to be true forks, nonetheless would eventually reach their chance in the chronological flux. As they did, their time passed. They would be used up. Thus, the commission studying the problem came to realize that the tree of prophecy without the growth and life that it drew from prophets, from the constant stream of prophecy feeding the many branches, would eventually die. Their task and the purpose of this book, Continuum Ratios and Viability Predictions, was to try to predict how and when this would happen. The best minds in prophecy studied the problem, took a measure of the health of the tree of prophecy, through known formulas and predictions based on not only observed patterns and the decline of growth in prophecy, but a decline in profits to sustain it, they determined how this particular tree of knowledge would become heavy with the deadwood of false and expired prophecy as prophetic forks were reached and chronology moved on down the sections of branches still viable. As this happened, as the tree of prophecy grew thick with age and dead wood that could no longer be culled by true prophets, they predicted how it would become susceptible to, to, well, a kind of malady, a decay, much like an old tree in the forest will eventually become susceptible to disease. That decline in viability they found would, over time, leave prophecy vulnerable to any number of ever-growing problems. The infirmity that they concluded would be the most likely to strike first would come in a form they described as worm-like. They thought that it would begin to infest and destroy the living portions of the tree of prophecy itself, meaning the branches that are contemporary at the time of this worm-like infestation. In fact, they called it just that, a prophecy worm. The air felt heavy in the thick silence. Hands in his back pockets, Richard shrugged. So what's the cure? Astonished by the question, Zed stared at Richard as if he'd just asked how to heal a thunderstorm. Cure? Richard, these experts who wrote this book predicted that there wasn't any cure as such. They concluded in the end 
that without the vitality provided by new prophets, the tree of prophecy would eventually rot and die. They said that prophecy would only come back strong and healthy when new prophets returned to the world. In effect, when a seed of new prophecy sprouted and flourished, old trees die and make room for the new shoots. It was determined by these learned wizards that the fate of prophecy as we know it is also doomed to aging, infirmity, and eventual death. Richard had had to deal with any number of problems caused by prophecy, but the gloomy expressions around the table were infectious. It almost felt like a healer had come out of a back room to announce that an aging relative was near to passing on. He thought about all the gifted prophets devoted to their calling who had worked all of their lives to contribute to this great body of work that was now withering and dying. He thought about the statue he himself had worked so hard to create and how it made him feel when it was destroyed. He thought, too, that it might simply be the concept of death itself in any form that was so dismal because it reminded him of his own mortality and of Kalin's mortality. He also thought that it might be the best thing that could happen. After all, if people no longer believed that prophecy had foreordained what would become of them, then maybe they would realize that they had to think for themselves and decide what was in their own best interest. Maybe, if unchained from a deterministic mindset, people would realize that it was they themselves who actually controlled their own destiny. If people comprehended what was really at stake, maybe they would come to realize the value of reason in the choices they made, instead of mindlessly just waiting for what was to happen to happen. From what Anne and I have discovered, Nathan said into the still, stale air of the library, the branch of prophecy that is vanishing is that which refers to times roughly since Richard was born. That, of course, makes the most sense, because temporal souls nourish the active living tissue of prophecy upon which this prophecy worm would feed. But I was able to determine that it hasn't all simply vanished yet. Zed nodded. It's dying back, but from the root, so some of it is still alive. I've found pockets of it alive and well. That's right, especially the portions from the present on into the future. As you suggest, it seems that the scourge has attacked the core of these branches, which began two or three decades back, and so far have not extensively eaten their way into future events. That leaves sections of this prophetic branch the branch involving you that are still alive, the prophet said as he leaned on his hands toward Richard. But once it dies, we will then lose even those prophecies, along with the memory of how profoundly important they are. Richard glanced from Nathan's grim expression to Anne's equally serious face. He knew they had arrived at last at the heart of their purpose. That is why we've come looking for you, Richard Rao. Anne said with grave intonation, before it's too late. We have come about prophecy that so far is still alive and has warned us of the most serious crisis to face us since the Great War. Richard frowned, already unhappy that prophecy once again seemed about to cause him trouble. What prophecy? Nathan pulled a small book out of a pocket and flipped it open. As he held it in both hands, he fixed Richard with a steady gaze to make sure he looked like he was going to listen carefully. When Nathan was at last sure he had everyone's attention, he began. In the year of the cicadas, when the champion of sacrifice and suffering, under the banner of both mankind and the light, he glanced up from under his bushy eyebrows, that would be Emperor Jagang, finally splits his swarm. Thus shall be the sign that prophecy has been awakened and the final and deciding battle is upon us. Be cautioned, for all true forks and their derivatives are tangled in this mantic root. Only one trunk branches from this conjoined primal origin. If Fuer Grisa Ost Drauka does not lead this final battle, then the world, already standing at the brink of darkness, will fall under that terrible shadow. Dear spirits, Zed whispered, 
Fue Grisa Ost Drauka is a cardinal link to a prophecy founding a principal fork. Conjoining it with this prophecy establishes a conjugate bifurcation. Nathan arched an eyebrow. Exactly. Richard didn't fully understand what Zed had said, but he caught the drift, and he didn't need them to tell him who Fuer Grisa Ost Drauka, the bringer of death, was. It was him. Jagang has split his forces, Anne said with quiet power as she fixed Richard in her steady gaze. He brought his army up near to Aden Drill, hoping to finish it, but the Daharan forces, along with the people of the city, made use of winter to escape over the passes to Dahara and out of Jagang's clutches. I know, Richard said. That escape over the passes in winter was by Kalin's orders. She's the one who told me about it. Kara looked up in surprise, apparently intending to dispute his account, but after a glance at Nietzsche, she decided to remain silent, at least for the moment. At any rate, Anne said, sounding annoyed by the interruption, Jagang, unable to effectively use his vastly superior numbers to break through those heavily defended very narrow passes, has finally decided to split his forces. Leaving an army to watch the passes, the emperor himself took the main element of his army south, headed all the way back down through the midlands to skirt around the barrier of mountains and then hook around and make his way up into Dahara. Our forces are headed south down through Dahara to meet them. That was why, when we were able to get a message from Verna about the condition of the books of prophecy at the People's Palace in Dahara, she was able to ride south ahead of our army and go look them over herself. This is the year that the cicadas are returning, Nietzsche said, sounding alarmed. I've seen them. That's right, Nathan said, still leaning forward on both hands. That means the chronology is now fixed. The prophecies have all made their connections and have tumbled into place. Events are marked. In turn, he met the gaze of everyone in the room. The end is upon us. Zed let out a low whistle. More importantly, Anne said in an authoritative tone, it means that it is time for Lord Rahl to join the Daharan forces and lead them in the final battle. Without you there, Richard, prophecy is quite clear. All will be lost. We have come to escort you to the forces to help ensure that you make it. We dare not risk delay. We must leave at once. For the first time since they started talking about prophecy, Richard's knees felt weak. But I can't, he said. I have to find Kalin. It sounded to him like a plea into a gale. Anne took a deep breath, as if to bite her tongue while she searched for some urgently needed patience, or maybe words that would persuade him, and finally settle the matter once and for all. The two moored Sith shared a look. Zed pressed his thin lips tight while he considered. In frustration, Nathan tossed the book he was holding on the table and wiped his hand across his face as he planted his left fist on a hip. Richard didn't know what he could say to them all that would have any chance of making them understand that something profoundly serious was wrong in the world and Kalin was only a piece of the puzzle, by far the most important piece, but still a part of something much larger. Ever since the morning when she had disappeared, he had argued himself sick about the urgent need to find her, and it never seemed to do any good at convincing anyone that he knew what he was talking about. He had no interest in yet again wasting his energy on the same fruitless explanations. You what? Anne said, her displeasure bubbling up to the surface like dross in a cauldron. At that moment she was very much again the prelate, a squat woman who somehow managed to seem towering. I have to find Kalin, Richard repeated. I don't know what you're talking about. We simply don't have time for any of this nonsense. Anne had dismissed his wants, interests, and needs out of hand to say nothing of what he believed were his rational and important reasons. We have come to see to it that you get to the Daharan army immediately. Everyone is waiting on you. Everyone is depending on you. The time has come when you must lead our forces in the final battle that is now rapidly descending upon us. I can't, 
Richard said in a quiet but firm voice. Prophecy demands it, Anne shouted. Richard realized that Anne had changed. Everyone had changed in little ways since Kaylin had disappeared, but Anne had changed in more overt ways. The last time she had come, with the very same purpose, to demand that Richard go with her to lead the war, Kaylin had thrown Anne's journey book in a fire, telling the former prelate that prophecy was not driving events, but rather Anne was, by trying to make people follow prophecy in an effort to make it come true, that she was acting as prophecy's enforcer. Kaylin had shown Anne how she herself, as the prelate, by being prophecy's handmaiden, might very well have actually been the one who'd brought the world to the brink of cataclysm. Because of Kaylin's words, Anne had done some deep soul-searching that had eventually helped make her more rational and more understanding of how Richard was the one who had to choose to do what was right. Now, with the memory of Kaylin gone, everything that had happened with Kaylin was also wiped away. Anne, like everyone else, had reverted to the disposition she'd shown before Kaylin's influence. It made Richard's head hurt sometimes, just trying to recall exactly what Kalin had done with everyone that they wouldn't now remember, so that he could take that into account when he dealt with them. With some people, like Shota, it had actually in some ways helped him. Shota, for instance, because of losing her memory of Kalin, hadn't recalled that she told Richard that if he ever returned to Agaden Reach, she would kill him. With other people, like Anne, it was proving to make matters much more difficult. Kaylin threw your journey book in a fire, he told her. She was fed up with you trying to control my life, as am I. Anne frowned. I accidentally dropped my journey book in the fire myself. Richard sighed. I see. He didn't want to argue because he knew it would do no good. <laughs>